Well, good morning. We would like to welcome you to this Common Core State Standards Regional Leadership Session. We're delighted that you're here with us. We're all on a journey towards Common Core, and we're very pleased that you've chosen to spend the morning with us. For our official welcome, we're going to turn to our County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Arturo Delgado. Thank you, Raynette. Uh, well, looks like since 2000, what? We've been talking about Common Core, and here we are again. Uh, but this is such a critical, critical direction for the state of California. We're just thrilled that you're here. We're, we're glad to host uh, this morning. Uh, we're pleased to uh, support and ensure that what happens in the 80 school districts in Los Angeles County shines above the rest. And so we're pleased to be able to uh, host this event today. Uh, lots of work to be done. And so uh, today, what are you going to be hearing? Well, you're going to be, uh, today's agenda is going to focus on data, data that show areas of strength uh, in the transition to Common Core state standards and areas that still need some addressing and uh, research resources to support those areas. So. Uh, and, and we're real thrilled that we have two of our own school districts sitting on our panels today, Long Beach Unified School District and the Mountain View uh, School District. They're going to be a part of a, of a panel who will highlight uh, the common, their, their own common core journey and uh, share some successes and some challenges. And the uh, second panel will be addressing the communications and professional development. We're also happy to... Uh, have today with us a university partner, Dr. Fred Ui, uh, who will present to you the university's perspective on uh, uh, and partnership between the university and the county office and, and you as school districts. So today's session is being uh, broadcast live. There's a camera in the back. Uh, and it will also be archived for, for future viewing. So if there's anyone out there that you, uh, after today, um, can go back and say, you missed the session of a lifetime, okay? You go back and say that, then we have this archive. They'll be able to, to view this. So, so we want to uh, have, uh, so we have a lot of special guests with us today. And, but uh, to begin with, I would like to welcome our very special guest, Dr. David Plank from PACE, uh, who will moderate today's session and, and panel discussions. Dr. PACE. Thank you, Dr. Delgado. Um, yes, I'm, I'm David Plank. I'm the Executive Director of Policy Analysis for California Education, which is a, for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar with our work, uh, we're a research partnership of Stanford University, University of California at Berkeley, and the University of, University of Southern California. And those of you who, who've been to college in California know that those three institutions don't always uh, cooperate happily, so, so we're, we're, we're all about partnership, we're all about working together to uh, improve education in California. Um, I, I'd like to start today's meeting, first of all, just by saying thank you to a few people. First of all, to the LA County Office of Education, to Superintendent Delgado, to Yvonne Contreras, and to Renette Sanchez, who have helped us to organize the meeting here this morning. Uh, our main partner on this series of sessions is the California, the County Superintendents Association, CESESA. Um, we've also worked very closely on this with the California Teachers Association, and they have had representatives in each of our meetings. Uh, the funding for the sessions was provided by the Gates Foundation. I'd like to thank them. And we worked on the research that will be presented later this morning with Pivot Learning Partners, and uh, uh, I want to thank them as well. And, of course, I want to thank all of you, um, because Common Core is really at the center of the work that we're doing now in California, and I appreciate your commitment in coming out to these sessions and in moving the Common Core agenda for forward. Um, I really just want to say uh, one thing this morning, um, which is that 2007 wasn't that great. Uh, it wasn't that great a year for California education. Um, we look back and we say, gee, things were great in 2007. They weren't great in 2007. We were complaining a lot in 2007 about the lack of resources and the lack of uh, support from the state. So, so, so com the, the implementation of Common Core represents an opportunity not to get back 
to 2007, but really to move California's education system forward in a brand new way. And, and the local control funding formula gives us the flexibility and at least the promise of the resources that we need to successfully implement Common Core. So there, there's, a, there's a potential for a genuine transformation in the way that teaching and learning take place in California schools um, that, that are, that's accompanied by big challenges. Um, it's not going to be easy uh, to pull this off, but we have uh, a really a unique opportunity to, to make big changes, and we're here uh, in the hope that we can help you meet the challenges and successfully implement ca uh, Common Core. <coughs> so the, the primary purpose of the meeting is to introduce you to some tools and resources that can help you uh, with Common Core implementation. Um, and we'll hear from Mountain View School District in Long Beach about the, the steps that they've taken along that journey. Um, but as I say, uh, sort of the main message is that 2007 wasn't that great. 2020 can be great, and we're, we're hopeful that uh, we'll be able to join you as you move forward uh, towards a changed education system in California. Um, with that, uh, we have one more welcome, um, and I'm counting on our technology staff to crank it up, and we'll be uh, welcomed by Mike Kirst, who's the president of the State Board of Education. Good day. My name is Mike Kirst. I'm the president of the California State Board of Education and Professor Emeritus of Education at Stanford University. Thank you for taking your time to come to this important meeting. The top priority of the state government at this point, in my view, in education policy is the implementation of Common Core. It is uh, necessary and a major change for all our schools. Moreover, it changes so many state education policies and local implementation and local policies. You, it's a set of standards on what students should know and be able to do, but as you know, it changes assessments, curriculum, professional development, uh, special education, professional uh, teacher training, many, many other things. So it is a big challenge and will require a lot of integrated, coherent policy making on your part. The key, of course, is the changes in the classroom and profound changes in classroom instruction. That really is your job. We cannot do much with the state except assist you in every way possible that you want us to or we can do with our resources. It will take a long time uh, to uh, implement Common Core. Uh, it's not going to be done uh, overnight. We realize that. Therefore, there's a phase-in period uh, that will be uh, implemented over the next uh, uh, two to three years. But really, I see the full implementation of Common Core as something that will take place really in uh, more like five years uh, than one or two years. So we're aware of uh, the, the issues and challenges that, uh, that you face. And uh, we will be trying to adjust state policies and already have uh, to assist you in this transition. Moreover, the Common Core is part of an integrated package of state reforms. Uh, including uh, the local control funding formula uh, and other policies. The local control funding formula will give you more flexibility and more money over time uh, to implement the Common Core. Moreover, uh, we will be giving you, I think, the flexibility to spend money some centrally uh, on issues like professional development, uh, which cannot be done uh, exclusively at the school site. So we will be helping you in that, and, uh, but uh, the ball is in your court in terms of really implementing it. Pay attention to the local control accountability plan. Uh, that needs to be implemented and integrated with the Common Core. A part of our state design is to tie the allocation of budget resources to outcomes uh, that the state wants, and one of those key outcomes is the implementation of Common Core and then better for pupil for performance based on Common Core instruction. So you need to think of Common Core as part of a related set of state initiatives which reinforce and are aligned and are consistent uh, with our priority on Common Core. 
the state can uh, help you in, in, uh, in, in ways that I think are important. Uh, we're trying to pray, provide a more leadership uh, in bringing in ideas and resources from out of California, uh, for example, uh, to evaluate the various curriculum and technology programs that are out there for Common Core. Uh, the state will be mounting uh, through a foundation, uh, independent foundation, the, the state will uh, assist the foundation uh, in communication program uh, that will unveil itself in the next uh, few months. This is a $1.5 million communications program aimed at educators uh, with the idea that the educators are the best way to reach parents. So we're going to be making parents more clear and more uh, aware of, of the Common Core as best we can at the state level, but your job at the local level on communication of what the changes are in Common Core is even uh, more vital than whatever we can do. So it's a long path from state policy to classroom instructional change. The bulk of that is local responsibility local initiative and local implementation. We realize that, we applaud your efforts, uh, we appreciate the support we're getting from the bottom up on Common Core from uh, teachers and parents and, uh, and administrators and school board members. Basically, California is viewed as a leader in Common Core uh, and other states are watching how we do with this uh, as we push forward without the kind of pushback uh, in, in that's happened in depth in other states. So I wish you well in these endeavors and uh, I know your program will be interesting and exciting and uh, help you think about this in more fundamental ways. We're here at the state to, uh, uh, to uh, think about your problems and you need to tell us what, what you're experiencing and uh, we look forward to working with you over many years to implement uh, the Common Core. Thank you for your attention. some of the data that informs the work about Common Core state standards in California. Um, we're going to talk as a part of that process about a survey that was conducted by the County Superintendents Association, CSESA. And this survey was done in fall of 2013 and the results were reported to the State Board of Education. State Board of Education asked CSESA to conduct this study and it was conducted through interview and through questionnaire. And it was conducted for a couple reasons. One is the State Board of Education really wanted to get a snapshot of where we were right now. And part of where we are right now is important because we wanna know what the next steps are. As we chart the steps on the journey, as we look at the pathway and plan the best next steps to take, we wanna be able to be cognizant about where districts are, where they're going, what their successes are, what their challenges are as we move forward. When this survey was done, out of the 1,000 districts in California, 809 participated. It's a little bit more than 80% of the districts. All but two counties were represented. Most of you in the room are from LA County. LA County was well represented. I'm sure a number of you remember sharing data as a part of this survey. So the important thing is that this represents 83% of the student population in the state. And so as we look at student results, as, as we look at survey results, this is important because we know it's representative of the vast majority of districts. Whoops, we went the wrong way. Okay, whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay. So some of the findings, and I'm going to share just some of the findings from this larger report. We do have the complete report that's available for you. It will be in the follow-up resources that we send to you. If you want to read every single detail, it's in there for you, but for now we'll focus on just some of the big ideas. So one of the things the study found was that everybody is working on preparation for Common Core State Standards. Every district that we talked to was doing that work. 
districts were in different places in the transition. So some had started several years before, some were um, more late arrivals to the process, but everybody was engaged in the work, regardless of what phase they were in. We found that awareness of Common Core state standards was high among teachers and administrators, although knowledge was slightly higher among administrators as they rolled out the information. Also, one of the things the survey found is that the level of information among teachers varied. So some teachers were more knowledgeable than others, typically teachers who taught mathematics or reading language arts or other core subject areas frequently had a little higher level of knowledge about Common Core state standards. One of the things the survey found is that there were some differences in terms of how districts rolled out information about the standards and correlated assessments with smarter balanced assessments to our multiple stakeholder groups. And you can see from this chart, and I know the words down at the bottom are very little, but the blue section is um, districts who have reached out to all of these various stakeholder groups. So you can see a lot of connection with administrators and teachers. The golden rod is planned um, connection or planned information dissemination or communications. And then that gray part in the top is where it hasn't happened yet, it hasn't been planned yet. Um, no doubt it's going to happen, we're just not quite there yet. So if you look on the far left-hand side, you see a lot more activity among administrators, teachers, students and parents, and less among community members, local business, local media, and others. Not to say that it's not going to happen, just that we're on the journey, and that's one of the later pieces to come up yet. Similarly, when we looked at school district approaches to um, implementing the Common Core, standard, Common Core State Standards, there was variation among districts. We found about 48% of the districts did all at once. And typically districts that were starting a little bit later in the process used the all at once approach. They were more in a hurry to get the information out there and get it to everybody who needed the information. Um, districts that started a little bit earlier were more likely to say that they approached the data uh, and did roll out by grade level, by content area, or by school. Some of the challenges in Common Core implementation, I think everybody who's engaged in the process can relate to all of these. Time, there's just not enough time in the day. And more than one district said, well, just leave it to us in California to change everything at the same time. And that was kind of a common sentiment. So not only are the standards changing, the assessment changing, the accountability framework, the tests, um, the policy, uh, school finance and funding, a lot of change all at once and people end up feeling crunched on time. They're very willing, ready and able to do all the good work but it requires time and that's sometimes in short supply. Funding, um, we know funding is a common need and concern as well. The one-time state uh, funding for Common Core State Standards is valuable and important and an asset. And we found that districts tended to split those funds between technology, professional development, and instructional materials. But districts would like more. And a recent access survey underscored that same um, feeling. People need more funding. Districts need more funding to do and sustain the work. The instructional shifts, rolling out those instructional shifts and making sure that every teacher, every subject area, every level is cognizant of and connected to and confident in making those instructional shifts with students. That's a tall piece of work. It's a big order to be able to do. And that was a challenge. We see increased rigor in all that we do and it's a challenge to help make sure all of our systems and each and every part are, um, are, are in that place that we want to be. And then finally, curriculum materials and assessments. And again, every district was working on this. We didn't find any district that said, we've got all the curriculum plan. We've got all our pacing plans and guides and lessons and units. Nobody's there yet. We're still at the beginning stages of the process. So people said, we need more time. We need to work more on curriculum materials and assessments. 
In the area of mathematics, there were some particular challenges. So districts reported that they were looking closely at uh, selecting a mathematics pathway and about what pathway to choose. It's not an easy choice, and it's not a choice that districts make lightly. There are a lot of factors they think about, their work, their articulation with other levels, um, parent and community sentiment, pedagogically what seems to make most sense for them. So that choosing a mathematics pathway is something of a challenge. And then navigating the upcoming textbook adoption. So we know the State Board has adopted instructional materials. We've had an instructional materials fair actually too in LA County. Districts are looking at implementing and purchasing books or not. Some are going to wait till a later year. Some are going to make a selection this year. So that's a particular challenge for districts. When we look at what districts are choosing as they're thinking about traditional pathways or integrated pathways, we find slightly more, about a third, seem to be selecting the integrated pathway. About 26% are looking at keeping traditional. And significantly, about 42% have said they're not sure yet. They're still studying. They have not yet made a decision. So that's a, a kind of a special challenge in the area of mathematics. In terms of needs, I think many of these resonate with many people in the room, certainly. Districts would like to have more access to resources such as guides, templates, and samples. They'd like to see some of the things that have been created by others and learn from those and be able to share some of their own. The high quality, affordable, professional development, again, thinking about everybody who's a part of the system and the professional that development that's required to take them to a comfort level with teaching to common core, sta common core state standards is also seen as a need. And then support for technology systems and resources. Um, this is a big area for people. They talk about uh, the need to look at hardware, at devices, at software, at teaching technology skills to students, at preparing teachers to teach technology skills, preparing students for assessments, looking at the infrastructure in their districts. All of these were areas of need and challenge. And then resources for particular populations. These stood out as we did this survey. Um, the need for resources for English learners is a need that more than half the districts felt was important and significant. And they were not um, comfortable where, with where they were at this point in time. They had more work they wanted to do and needed to do. And the same is true with respect to um, resources for students with special needs. Some additional needs that districts expressed, and this is across the state, districts said they would like to learn from the successes and challenges, particularly from districts that are a little bit ahead. And that's one of the reasons that we have Long Beach and Mountain View with us today. Um, they're going to share some of their successes, some of their challenges. And this was kind of a common refrain around the state, let us learn from others um, so that we don't recreate the wheel. And then resources for communications with multiple stakeholders. Again, districts were very cognizant that they hadn't touched everybody that they wanted to reach in that process. And uh, they would find additional resources in this area helpful. So this data has informed ongoing work in county offices of education around the state, at the State Board of Education, and at the California Department of Education. It was part of the impetus for these regional leadership sessions, and there's six of these sessions that are being held around the state. It also informed development of the leadership guide, and you have a copy of the CESA leadership guide um, when Yvonne Contreras talks a little bit more about resources later in the program. We'll take a closer look at that guide among other resources. And then finally, we've all taken a great leap as we work to address Common Core State Standards, we've done a lot, and that's clearly evident from all of the work, all of the discussions we've had with people along the way. Sometimes it's been a leap of faith, that, you know, you have that feeling of leaping over a higher bar. Um, people are very cognizant that they're kind of mid-leap, they're in that process, they've done a lot, they've accomplished a lot, but there's still more work to do, and so we have still more in front of us. 
as we continue our program today, we're going to come back to some of the big themes that we talked about that, that uh, came from the data. And we'll be able to discuss those as we move forward. We'll hear from our district colleagues uh, about their journey, about some of the successes and challenges. And we'll hear about resources that can help you in your work. And with that, we're going to go back to David Pong to start our work with Karen. Dish slide. So this <laughs> is <a> <laughs> so this is where you make the great leap of faith. We're jumping to greet a higher, reach a higher target. So, so I, I'm on your program uh, to talk about a, a research report that that Pace uh, sponsored on getting to the core with what early implementers are doing. Uh, but we're fortunate today to have the author of the report, and he can do a much better job presenting the report than I can. So I'm pleased to introduce Brent Brown from Pivot Learning Partners. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? We're having June gloom in March, huh? I came from Northern California. I was expecting sunshine. But um, I want to talk to you today about this report that we put together with PACE on early implementers and uh, implementing the Common Core, what we learned from them. Uh, the purpose of the report was really to inform practitioner, practitioners and policymakers um, about the wide range of design and implementation choices districts have and really to um, inventory those, both the technical ones and the change strategies, how they're managing the human side of the uh, initiative and how they're making sure that the technical changes they're working on are reaching every site, every uh, classroom. Um, and we also wanted to surface some early uh, implementation barriers and lessons learned. And uh, this report also informs a strategy guidebook for leaders that uh, we'll also talk about later uh, in the program today. Um, the devil is really in the details, and um, what we did is we profiled 11 districts. So um, the report, at the end of the report in the appendix, there's 11 district profiles, including two from um, this county, Baldwin Park and Long Beach Unified, where we interviewed executive leaders about their strategies, um, what their theory of action was, how they're managing the change, and what are the tools and resources they've created locally to help them implement the Common Core. So the first key finding was that um, districts are obviously engaged in a wide range of technical strategies, but they really focused, when they started early, they really focused on one or two technical core strategies uh, for their approach to Common Core. So they, they were you know, maybe focusing on instruction and building the capacity of teachers to implement student-centered instructional strategies that are called for in the Common Core, or maybe they were uh, focused on curriculum. Of those focused on curriculum, I would say very few purchased instructional materials and led the implementation of Common Core with the adoption of a new textbook. They were actually enrolling um, significant numbers of teachers to do the design of curriculum um, you know, uh, with their central office, of course, too. Many were focused on assessment and designing CCS-aligned assessments, uh, of which uh, a writing was a major focus, developing a uh, writing assessment, a rubric to measure that writing, um, and um, doing collective assessing of, of writing uh, across a district was a common strategy. Project-based learning was also a major strategy, especially for districts who had invested for many years in um, instructional strategies that focused on direct instruction. Project-based learning seemed to be a nice uh, way to kind of uh, couple that uh, focus with uh, what they had worked on in the past. And a few districts were really um, leveraging the Common Core to, to work on personalized learning, blended learning, or, uh, or uh, something of the sort like that. So those were the main technical strategies. Um, we also learned that um, very few were integrating the ELD, their work on Common Core with the new ELD standards and next generation science standards. So this was a, a major lesson learned that I just wanted to flag um, the, the the Common Core ELA standards and the new ELD standards are very closely aligned, and we were expecting to see more integration there, but hadn't um, in, in, in many of the districts that we talked to. Um, the other major finding was that districts are employing a wide range of strategies to solve the d 
design challenge of how they're going to ensure that the technical strategies on curriculum assessment and instruction were reaching uh, each site in every classroom. Um, so uh, Long Beach, who is here today, and they're going to talk more. Uh, they're an interesting example of, of really structuring this work. So they had, they have a whole job organizational chart on Common Core implementation with various committees doing different work. Um, they've also very closely worked the, um, uh, combined the work that they're doing with principals and teachers in a very structured way to ensure that it's reaching all the classrooms. Um, many districts, and in fact most, were employing some type of train the trainer model where they were investing significantly more in professional learning to train a, a cadre of teacher leaders at, at the sites and then setting expectations for those teacher leaders to roll out what they've learned to their peers. And they were, they were, there's a lot of challenges in that strategy and making sure that those teacher leaders have the skills that they need to be able to do that and the resources to do it. And instructional coaching, um, most districts had indicated that they had increased the number of instructional coaches that they had at the district to kind of hardwire the professional learning that teachers um, were getting in, through the district or at the county office or something like that. Okay, um, the, the, the third main finding is that districts were employing um, what we found as eight common um, change management strategies. So they were addressing the human side of this change initiative in eight, eight common ways that I want to share with you. The first was they are connecting the Common Core to a local vision for improved teaching and learning. So yes, Common Core is great. Um, they you know, use a lot of the messages we're going to talk about later today. But for them, they localized it. And so uh, a great example is a local example here in Baldwin Park. Baldwin Park's um, vision is, is all about college and career readiness and 21st century skills. Uh, their strategic plan focused on that. Their business community is really about that. Their parents are about that. And so Common Core was just a tool to help them get to their vision. And everything, all the strategies that they're doing around Common Core have a clear through line to what their vision for improved teaching and learning is. And that is focused around college and career readiness. And so they've infused 21st century skills as a big part of their core strategy. But when you, when you, when you ask them what their core strategy is for Common Core, they, they really connect it to something bigger and, and more local. They're carefully managing the pace of change. Um, they talk about this being a journey that we're not going to get there tomorrow, but we're going to make progress every day. And they're sensitive to, um, we, we talk about in the strategy guidebook, the Goldilocks problem of getting the amount of learning and change that teachers are doing to be enough to motivate them to recognize that the Common Core is a second order change and is going to require a whole host of changes. But they're not um, overloading them with so much information, so many new resources, so many new tools that they don't know what to do and they get stuck. Um, 10 of the 11 districts that we talked to um, felt that they were, with the Common Core they were significantly increasing um, more autonomy to the sites. I will say that Long Beach was the one district that, that didn't start out that way. Um, but what they're learning is that um, when they increase autonomy, they're also having to balance this with, with a lot more support. Um, es and especially with Common Core being so new, they really had to ease into that role. This was a big change. A lot of them were learning teachers were saying, well, just tell me what to do. And so um, a, this autonomy was new, and they had to really effectively manage that transition. Many of them were designing um, we're implementing the Common Core by enrolling teachers in the design process. Um, why were they doing this? Well, they felt that um, you know that central office sh should really be responsible for the core strategy, but when it comes to tactics, um, it's often best uh, left to those closer to the classroom. So they're handing off tactical implementation of a new rubric, maybe a new unit, um, certainly a lot of curriculum to teachers, to teams of teachers, and they were finding that that was creating buy-in for their core strategy, but it was also promoting a lot of innovation, and it was a great way to build capacity to create uh, a cadre of um, local experts who could really be their leaders ar around Common Core at the site level. 
And then I thought of another reason when I was talking to Brian, who's going to uh, speak later. It's a great way to recognize teachers for the work that they do. I think we struggle to do this. We can only increase their pay so much, et cetera. But enrolling them in the design, putting them on a design team is a great way to recognize the great work that they do for the districts. Um, districts are building and repurposing feedback loops. Um, and then they're using that data to refine the strategies and tactics that they're employing. Um, and we talked to executive leaders there saying, I haven't been out to the sites this much in years. They're really getting out there and listening to their principals and their teachers about how implementation is going. Um, most of the districts have obviously realized that um, their site administrators and their teacher leaders are the linchpin to the success of their um, initiative. And they're really carefully focusing the work of their principals. Long Beach is going to talk uh, later, but I was really impressed by how they've sequenced the work that's happening with teachers and principals so that principals are aware of what teachers are learning in their professional learning, but also getting um, specialized uh, support around instructional leaders to help coach teachers through the change. They're setting clear and feasible expectations for implementations at all levels. Teachers know exactly what they're supposed to do after professional development. Um, one example is one district who said, you know, after doing a lot of work around math, what we want you to do is we want you to change every formative assessment to have to include two questions that model the SBEC and have like a performance-based element to it. That's the expectation. Really clear next, what next steps are about implementation. Oh, how far have I gone already? Oh. And then they're obviously engaging parents and community. The big uh, key finding here was that, yes, they were doing macro stuff, new website, newsletters, videos, uh, town hall meetings, et cetera. But a lot of them realized that teachers were their best messengers, and they were arming teacher, teachers with messages to deliver during um, parent, teachers parent and teacher conferences. And we learned that most of the communication to this point had been mostly informed. And um, there, there hadn't been a lot of um, seeking feedback on the strategies and tactics that the district was taking around Common Core, but this was beginning to change with the implementation of LCAP that required a lot more of that type of engagement. Um, the report also serviced a lot of the common implementation barriers that were also talked about um, um, earlier this morning with the SASASA survey. Um, the biggest, uh, of course, being that there's not a, enough time. And so districts are really thinking, you know, this is a long-term journey. We don't have to get there tomorrow. Um, but they're also really carefully thinking about how they have to restructure their day to be able to do all this work. Um, this research report informed a strategy guidebook that is, um, will be talked about later uh, that talks about some of the uh, strategies to use as you're, as you're tackling these three different types of um, implementation strategies. And uh, both of the reports are available on the PACE website. Uh, and the links are right here. So thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this report. OK, I'd like to invite our two panels up to the uh, podium. We have a, a team from Mountain View School District and a team from Long Beach and they'll talk about their implementation efforts on Common Core. So Long Beach al already got a bit of a shout out from Brant, so I'm gonna <laughs> give, give, give first place to, to Mountain View here. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce the, the, uh, the leaders of the two teams and ask them, first of all, to talk, uh, to introduce the members of their team and also to talk a bit about the demographics and the uh, circumstances of their district. So I'd first like to uh, introduce Lillian Maldonado-French, who is the superintendent in Mountain View, and ask her to introduce her team. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I said, my name is Lillian Maldonado-French. I'm the uh, superintendent of Mountain View School District, and here with me today is Darren Deckenecker. He's our Acting Assistant Superintendent of Ed Services. Ray Andre, Principal of Crans Intermediate School. Um, uh, Priscilla Figueroa, she's a fifth, yay. 
Can you, do you have a problem with sound? Could you move the mic closer? Is that better? Okay. All right. Keep talking. I'll keep talking. How's that? I'll use my outdoor voice. Um, Priscilla Figueroa, she's a fifth grade teacher at Parkview Elementary, and Lily Rubalcaba, she's a third grade teacher at Voorhees Elementary. So this is our team. You want to know a little bit about ourselves? Okay. We're a K-8 district here in, in Los Angeles County in the southeast corner of the San Gabriel Valley. Um, we have 7,500 students, um, 12 schools. We have 95% free and reduced lunch. About 60% of our students are English learners. Uh, we're a community with challenges, but we're a community filled with uh, high capital, and uh, wonderful people who are interested in making uh, great changes in our community. Do you want me to tell you a little bit about? Yeah, we'll, we'll go on to that in a moment. I'll okay. Introduce, uh, okay, so and I'd like to introduce Jill Baker, who is the Assistant Superintendent for Elementary and K-8 Schools and the Chief Academic Officer in Long Beach. Thank you, we're glad to be here. Um, participating in a panel like this always causes us a lot of reflection and opportunity to really think about our work and sharing it with you. So to my right is Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Professional <coughs> Development, and also our Program Assistance for Language Minority Students, Pamela Secchi. Lisa Worsham to her right, K-5 um, ELA and ELD Curriculum Leader. And to her right, Maria Yepes, fourth grade teacher leader, um, who will share several different aspects of her classroom work, as well as her participation in many of our district teacher leadership opportunities. And our district is about 82,000 students. Um, approximately 25% of those students are English language learners, and about two-thirds of them are um, receive free and reduced lunch. We have um, about 82 schools, 44 elementary, 9 K-8, 15 middle schools, and 12 high schools, three of which are small high schools, six of, uh, three are alternative, and then six are comprehensive high schools. Um, and I guess many of the same, I would say many of the same things about our district. We have a long history of a focus on professional development for teachers and principals that we've really um, been able to customize and to think differently about in the age of Common Core implementation. Um, and when I think about our work, I think about not only transformation of teaching and learning, but also the opportunity that we hope to share with you today that's about the transformation of how we do our work in the district in, in this area of Common Core implementation. Um, as many of you know, you're here because this work is hard, it's messy, it requires a different kind of thinking, and so one of the things I know we all want to be able to share is that while there are things that we feel really successful in, there are things that we're really working hard to improve upon, and we hope you hear that place in, in this journey in our conversation today too. Okay, thank you very much. And I hope you'll forgive me if I use your first names, if that's, sure. is that okay? Okay. So Lillian, I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the district's vision uh, and how Common Core implementation fits into that. Well, it fits in beautifully because our philosophy to school improvement is truly a systems approach um, that is best described by uh, glowing slow and going deep. So what you'll hear today is many of the strategies that you heard earlier in the PowerPoint and maybe perhaps in how a small school district manages those changes. And um, our journey to Common Core really began five years ago because we uh, partnered with uh, Dr. Robin LaSalle from Principals Exchange Foundation and really began uh, aligning our curriculum towards an entire system approach that really was based on the premise that teachers and not a program um, held the key to student learning. And so we really focused on a um, more autonomous view of curriculum design. Great. And Jill, do you want to take the same question? Sure. So our district has a strategic plan. It's in its second five-year iteration, which really gives the foundation for our Common Core implementation. Um, there's a clear focus in the strategic plan on college and career readiness. We have a board approved graduate, um, a student graduate profile. And so our work really emanates from the, the belief and our, our belief in a systems approach of um, a system of excellent schools that are all striving towards readying students for the world of college and career. Um, and our, I think just to give a bit of the timeline, 
today, we'll talk about really a four-year progression, 2011-12, really around an awareness campaign to um, think about transformation of all of the systems in the district and, and help people to understand what will happen in Common Core implementation. It's when our steering committees formed and when we started to map out who will do what aspect of work in Common Core implementation. We spent last year in a huge effort to help teachers and principals and district staff really understand the instructional shifts necessary. Different than going into standards first, we really spent time focused on instructional shifts um, in professional development for principals, professional development for teachers, and also professional development for district leaders. This year our work has really been about um, system-wide implementation of the standards themselves um, and mapping on what we call transitions in pedagogy. We come from a very prescriptive essential elements of effective instruction foundation, really 20 plus years of having a common aspect of pedagogy that's K-12 in our system. And while that has been effective and will continue to be effective in many environments, one of the things that we knew is that we needed to make some shifts in the kinds of lessons that teachers were teaching, a look at the um, understanding the by design way of looking at curriculum and make those transitions. And so this year our efforts have been really around how to, how to transition pedagogical strategies in classrooms. And next year heading into new, new district assessments, one of the things that we did to create a, um, an environment of experimentation is we suspended two things. One is our K-5 report cards became progress reports. And secondly, we suspended all of our district, well, I should say almost all of our district assessments. We have a couple of assessments that are anchored in our promotion retention policy, which remain, but all of the other um, typical quarter exams and trimester tests we suspended so that teachers really felt a sense of opportunity to experiment in their classroom without so many of the assessment practices that were no longer aligned to what we were implementing in terms of curriculum and instruction. So we hope that you'll hear more about that story as you, as you listen in. Can I, shall I share a few just milestones? Sure. Or, okay. And I, I think, um, and Brent talked a, a little bit about this in terms of our work, but places to hear us as we, as we think aloud with you today that are milestones for us. One is a huge effort at collaboration between our curriculum instruction and assessment design work and the supervision and, and support to school principals. And we think of that um, juncture as the way that we've operationalized and really watched the implementation aspect of work. And I think it's that interdependence that hopefully you'll hear in many of the things that we talk about that we know that we could have the best materials and curriculum, the, the most perfectly designed lessons for teachers to use, or we could also have principals that on, from a different perspective were really trained in looking at student work or observing a teacher teach a lesson. But it is the point where these two things come together in our worlds in Long Beach that we've really found um, just beauty in the work of how we both look at things uh, that we're, we're aiming towards these common goals. We see them from different perspectives, but when we talk about implementation, this has really been, um, the last couple of years, I'd say, really been the crux of, of change and transformation in our work. So we hope you'll hear that as our story. What that looks like are things like we host, a, we facilitate an um, implementation steering committee. There's one for K-8 and one for high school implementation. Those are half curriculum staff and half school supervisor staff talking together about what implementation looks like. We use a, we use a common walkthrough um, process elementary, middle, and K-8, and then one that's separate for high school. It's aligned to, to teacher professional development so that when we're out looking in classrooms, it's not a random arrow. It's not what a principal, him or herself, wants to look at. It's aligned to the sequence of professional development. And then we're looking together at what implementation looks like in a classroom. Um, we've had, you'll hear about whole district engagement and really the strategic thinking about mapping of responsibilities. So if we're going to directly engage teachers in a certain kind of learning, what that would mean for a principal and then who will provide certain aspects of professional development at the district level and at, at the site level. So many, many aspects of our work that we feel have transformed the way that we think and transformed the systems that we use in our district. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so as you all know, uh, vision is a great thing, but the teachers actually have to do the work. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like uh, Priscilla and Lily uh, to talk a little bit about what this looks like from the teacher's perspective in Mountain View. Well, we've, I don't know. <laughs> Am 
I loud enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, as teachers, we we were invited to um, participate in uh, te as teacher leads. We kind of self-selected ourselves. Whoever whoever wanted to participate in the teacher lead positions could. It, it's been an open policy, and we've gone from learning about the Common Core for a couple of years now, learning about what was coming up, and now moving towards uh, creating curriculum maps and pacing charts and looking at what that might look at look like, taking a look at practice assessments from the SBAC. Uh, some of us were able to participate in the actual writing of SBAC items through the state. So bringing back that knowledge and now working with teams to actually create uh, pacing charts and the actual assessments and what that would look like. We are in the beginning stages of that right now so that that in turn comes back to the classroom really looking at backward design and noting what are students, what are the expectations with the Common Core and bringing that back um, with our all practices that are already in place and uh, changes that we feel we need to make. If I could uh, continue on with that line of thought. Over the past five years, Mountain View has worked closely with Dr. Robin LaSalle from Principals Exchange uh, in providing professional development opportunities for our administrators first and then our educators partnering with them in the area of curriculum alignment. So over the past five years, um, we began work when money was scarce in the state, we know that, and we were fortunate to have a new superintendent come on to Team Mountain View with a vision and she had a mission and she wrote grants for us to begin to have summer week-long institutes for teachers to participate in this curriculum alignment to the old state standards where we designed our year-long maps by grade level by school site. So it was very specific to the needs of our students based on the data from the CSD at the time. Based on that, we looked at where our strengths were for our students and our needs. We developed our unit assessments and then we backwards mapped, kind of like the Wiggins and McTie model where we came up with essential agreements for each unit on strategies that we were to implement and then reflect on the data um, by grade levels during those grade level articulation meetings. Um, last year, this past summer, we took those standards and lead teachers came together in the summer and morphed those year-long plans to the Common Core standards. We saw that there was a lot that we were already doing and we merely needed to fill in some gaps where standards had moved to other grade levels. Um, again, as Priscilla had stated, the district has been very open in inviting teachers to become teacher leads or lead learners along with the principals. And it has really been um, very considerate, I think. Our transition has been very considerate of the entire educational community in Mountain View, um, where principals have been learning mm -hmm. along with us. So we're all learning together. And as the messages are coming down through the pipe, we are also inviting our parents to learn along with us as we're learning with the students. We still have our unit assessments, but we have morphed them to Common Core assessments where we have embedded um, constructed response writing into each of our assessments, and we still look at it. Mm -hmm. But because there isn't such an emphasis on the state test, Teachers feel safe to try new strategies such as um, the guided reading, word work with emphasis on Greek and Latin roots, um, the phonics. Uh, in, what are they called? Interactive notebooks have been great. Principals use them, teachers use them at all their meetings. Students are using them to study on the playground um, and parents are using them in their meetings. So a lot of the strategies that we've been trained on over the past five years are very common core compatible strategies that teachers are feeling very comfortable with. So I think that the operative word in our district is safe. We feel safe to try new things. We feel safe sharing with each other. Principals come in to observe our lessons. We go and observe other teachers' lessons, and it's a wonderful learning process that we've engaged in over the past five years. Great. Thank you. And Maria, you, have to see, you can probably feel this question coming to you, so, so I'll, I'll give you the next word. 
also um, just to add on to Jill, to Jill's um, comments about what's happening at the district level where the principals are being trained in the transitions of the pedagogy. Um, they're providing st uh, staff development to us, but also with the collaborative walkthroughs, teacher leaders or lead teachers are invited to go to these walkthroughs. That way principals and teachers collaborate on what's working in our schools and what we're seeing in other schools. Um, with the curriculum offices, we do believe in the trainer of trainer lead teacher model where we are provided the staff development from the staff um, from curriculum offices. Then we go back to our sites where we teach our teachers as well as our parents. Um, the design of our ELA units and our math units are developed with the curriculum leaders that Ms. Lisa will talk about later, but also with working with teachers and it gives us that buy-in. And what's unique about LBUSC is that we have, we are building the capacity within our teachers with the trainer of trainer models. Um, with that, we're going back to our sites, we're collaborating with our principals, we're planning together. We have a district planning time at each site and our sites are providing grade level release time so that we can collaborate by sharing our assessments and planning our next steps. Um, to add on to the fact that this is change, we need a lot of flexibility. It, we, need to, we are challenged to take risks. Um, it's a journey, we're making those mistakes and thus leading to what Jill mentioned about the district progress reports. Um, it was a result of teacher input by our teacher council they initiated the move towards this progress report because we said we need to have a supportive um, learning environment. And so we're focusing on change. Um, we're, we're focusing on embracing the change and the focus is on the process. Thanks. As, as Mike Kirst mentioned in the, in the video, uh, the state did provide uh, one and a quarter billion dollars to support Common Core and many of us hope that they'll provide uh, some additional resources uh, in the coming year. Um, how has Mountain View thought about the allocation of those resources between uh, materials, technology, and professional development? Well, I think for Mountain View, we really looked at, you know, what was our needs at, at this moment. And our needs really have fallen into continuing the professional development. We've looked at um, not only as has been shared as our administrators have been doing ongoing professional development now for over three years, four years actually. And along with that, a lot of the, the common core like strategies that we are also using in the classroom, the administrators are getting up front. So we've been using some of that money, obviously, to train our administrators, also with our teacher leads that we're using this money, and um, mm -hmm. other professional developments. We've had two summer uh, institutes on Common Core and looking at what those changes would be, where the shifts are in the standards based uh, alignment process, as well as what um, strategies. And from that, developing what we call our, our framework, our Common Core compatible framework of uh, strategies and instruction that we use. So our money uh, has been used in a lot of training in those areas. We're also developing what we call our resource steering committees. So looking at the realization that uh, textbook adoption is moving with math. Uh, ELA, we're looking probably from what I've heard the fall of 2015. So in the meantime, uh, our emphasis has really been Going back to the report that we heard regarding the issues of concern, uh, one of them had to do with resources and materials. Knowing that those materials would not, would not necessarily be available, we decided that we would use our experts within our own district and we would pull those people together and we would use their knowledge of uh, standards, their knowledge of curriculum and what we have and what they're using to bring together that team as our resource steering committee. And those individuals are working to provide resources to our unit designs. Um, for our Common Core, and so at this point, we're, you know, we're 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 hoping that some of this money will yet be able to be used for technology, but uh, the reality is, even though we're very pleased with the uh, the amount of money that we did receive from the state, uh, the technology needs are great, and at this point, our biggest focus is going to be on classroom instruction and lesson design for children, and so that's where our money is focused. Great, thank you. And same question to Long Beach. In Long Beach, we have pushed out a great deal of the Common Core funding to the sites for local control over that professional development, uh, the technology infrastructure, and instructional materials. Our emphasis has been around uh, getting our schools ready technology-wise. So we have installed 107 labs across our schools. 
and to operationalize those labs because they were beautiful and teachers and students were looking at them, but they weren't being used. So we created what we're calling navigational skills lessons, which are daily lessons that focus on providing students access to the Smarter Balanced Assessment, as well as a keyboarding program. So we've provided those daily lesson plans to our teachers, provided training to our teachers, um, but most importantly, we've posted them on the internet and have reached out to parents so that they can continue that work at home with their students. And it also gives the parents an idea of the depth of knowledge that students will need to demonstrate on the Smarter Balanced Assessments. Our professional development has been highly targeted toward making our, to building the capacity of our teachers in the classroom, as well as that of our principals as instructional leaders, as my colleagues have described. Um, we repurposed our instructional materials, our previous adopted materials, and wrote our own curriculum, scope and sequence, and unit guides using those materials. We didn't feel that commercially there were products available for us yet, and we really wanted to maintain the scaffolds that are a part of our daily work and the use of, for example, thinking maps. And so by writing our own curriculum, we were able to incorporate that, our in tiered instruction that provides scaffolds for English learners and students with special needs. Um, we have uh, really focused on using a collaborative inquiry process, which brings together the work of the professional development by having site visits where principals will walk their site with a visiting principal, lead teachers from their site as well as other sites, be able to really explore what's happening and provide feedback that goes back to our implementation steering committees, which then in turn informs the professional development that we're able to provide. And Raymond Andre, a lot of people have mentioned principals. Principals are clearly at the center of a lot of this work. Uh, how does this look from your point of view? Um, I, I think our superintendent, I mean, really did have the wisdom five years ago to start off by starting professional development with principals and administrators first. Uh, a year before we rolled out to our teachers, uh, we went through the same process that we were going to take them through the prior year. And the expectation was not only did we know it, we'd be able to do it. Uh, there were times where we had to present demo lessons in front of other principals uh, of the same things that we were going to then go back and train our teachers in. And what we started off with was a process of curriculum alignment where we created unit assessments and that led into a process of data reflection. Uh, our data reflection protocol is we meet with teachers and their teams about every 25 days uh, after instruction and we disaggregate student data by looking at our subgroups, our English learners, our students with disabilities, our entire student population, and we talk about students by name. And we practice this an entire year with our principal teams prior to implementation. So by the time it came time for rollout, we were facilitating with our staff, we were very clear on the process and the expectation, and the expectation for us was very clear of, of what we were supposed to do. Um, another huge help has been, we call it taco teams. Uh, and the premise is if you eat together, you hang out together, you work together, the work goes deeper and it goes further. Um, so principals are in PLCs or taco teams and we're in groups and we do joint walkthroughs of each other's school. And we have for elementary and secondary um, really a one page instructional framework and common core plan that talks about the common strategies throughout the district, including interactive notebooks, uh, structured think pair shares, uh, using reflection with students in their note-taking process. And all of those things we choose as principals that we go out and monitor. And we also allow the same opportunities for our staff. Um, one thing is the expectation and one thing is what we do is at our staff meetings, if we present something, um, for example, we, we presented child abuse uh, this year, which is a thrilling ribbon concept to go over. Um, it was presented through an instructional framework. And so as you're practicing these strategies at staff meetings and opening of the school year, it really reinforces and shows to teachers that 
any concept that you have to learn, there's a Mountain View way. And the Mountain View way offers you a great deal of flexibility in how to do it, but we do have some basic premises on lesson design and what the expectation for learning and monitoring and checking up on students, students are. And Lisa Worsham, in, in Long Beach, what steps have you taken to ensure that Common Core implementation supports English language learners and ELD students? That's a tough concept to tackle right now. Um, let me back up just a little bit before I get into what we're doing with our English learners now. Um, one of the things that we thought about as we entered into um, implementing the Common Core is what is the expectation going to be for our English learners? And very early on, we were fortunate enough to be involved in some training and working with Dr. Willie, Lily Wong Fillmore. And one of the things that we heard is that with Common Core, that at, you, you need to keep the expectation as high for your English learners and the kids that are struggling, <laughs> th that are reading before below grade level. And that was a little bit different than maybe how we had approached this in the past with um, typically kids reading below grade level. They would get resources that are written at their grade level or English learners perhaps were given a little bit of a different type of um, instruction and that sort of thing. So we weren't sure what it was going to look like because we didn't have the ELD standards yet. We hadn't studied the ELD standards yet about how they would um, blend together. So what we did is we approached it with, the, it, it's a non-negotiable high expectation that the kids that are English learners below grade level, special need, whatever the case, you will also have the access to the high quality text that is going to be included in our, our new units and the way that we'll have you, um, the kids will access it are through some of the different strategies that we've used in the past such as um, we've spent a lot of time with linguistic frames. We have, our district is very involved in using the thinking maps and then even the path to proficiency which is an extension of thinking maps for our English learners. Um, the notion of close reads and repeated readings and using those kind of strategies. Another area that we focused on for our English learners, and I don't know that it was specifically for the English learners, and maybe I can turn this over a little bit to Maria because she's got a classroom full of English learners, but um, now I lost my train of thought. Um, just, oh, the idea of the collaborative conversations. So one of the things that we've done in our district is we have created rubrics of what does a collaborative conversation sound like, look like, feel like, wh what, what, what's happening in those collaborative conversations. So we've developed one at the K2 level and then also at the 3-5 level. And it, it is those collaborations that are unlocking and giving access to our English learners with the content. So just to give you an example, um, it's real simple in our units and our lessons. The kids read, they talk, they think, and they write. And so at the heart of every lesson is a good piece of complex text. And it's through those scaffolds and those repeated readings that it's really giving some access to the kids that uh, building their language, giving them a purpose for using the language in their classrooms. And the emphasis on the collaborative discussions has been really powerful. So to add on to that with the collaborative discussions, I think we worked really hard at establishing a collaborative culture and what a common core looks like in the classroom. And we have to use models with our English language learners. So with that collaborative writing rubric, um, I, what I did was I took a model of a group having these discussions and my whole class had the rubrics in front of us. And so that group, they were generally the kids that you know would always participate, they were confident, in leading, I had a leader that was confident in leading the group. But again, what I wanted to do was I wanted my whole class to see what a collaborative discussion looks like and how it pertains to the rubric. Um, on that same day, we had the ELA office recording that same lesson in terms of you know connecting what they're doing to the rubric. And um, it was so random. I mean, we picked our ELL students, we picked a discussion leader, and the kids really rose up to the occasion because the expectations are high and the emphasis is on making sure you participate, making sure you're having this discussion so that you can add to add to the, the conversation, but also, um, but also, um, what's my train of thought? Um, but also show what you are learning. And so during this 
lesson, um, we had an example of JC, who was really like the discussion leader went to her and said, JC, what do you think? How does this text connect to our unit theme? And JC rose up to the occasion and she you know, added her input, she cited her evidence from the text, and she was like, you can tell from the video, she was like really proud of herself. And after the ELA office left, she was like, I was really proud of myself. I really, I didn't think I can do it, but I did it. And so what we're doing is we're getting the kids to have the confidence and to share what they're learning. Lillian, I, I, if I remember correctly, you said that 60% of your students in Mountain View are English learners. So, yes. so this has to be at the center of your strategy, right? It is, it is. And um, we began an approach where we looked at the English learners throughout our city with our neighboring district and also our high school district. And uh, just looking at the data, realized that we had a, uh, an issue with long-term English learners, students that were not making progress uh, throughout the city. So we collaborated with Dr. Lori Olson, who uh, of uh, reparable harm, and she has come in and worked with us in a really a two-pronged approach to develop a plan to intervene and support long current long-term English learners, and also how to prevent long-term English learners. So um, I think I'll pass it on to who wants to talk about long, what we've been doing. I, I, I can talk about okay. it. Okay. Um, so we began work with Dr. Olson and started off by reading Reparable Harm, and it really emphasized the urgency in our district. Yeah. Um, and I think more than anything, district-wide or multi-district-wide, the urgency was there. And what we did is we started out by shadowing students mm -hmm. and coming back and collecting data and then going back out and shadowing students and analyzing that data and determining what exactly were individual students in a classroom doing. Um, and we found everything from they never spoke. Um, they were engaged with social conversation with peers, but not with an adult in the classroom. And in presenting that data to staff, because unless you really go out and see it, you can say it, but it, it doesn't, mean, doesn't mean a lot. Uh, because you, know, you feel like, no, I, I'm surfacing all the students in your class, because that's all of our intention. Um, but what it led to is we had a piggyback grant on top of that from the California Community Foundation. And we began working with our language arts and math teachers to look at what does ELD across the day in the middle school look like. Most of our teachers are core teachers, so they're math and science, language arts, history. So by choosing those two groups, we really emphasized prompts, frames. Um, we are using programs or parts of programs like constructing meaning or systematic ELD in our schools, but how does that integrate into the core curriculum? And how do you ensure that students on a regular basis, every day in every subject area, get the use of structured academic language and the, the learning of, of English uh, through the content areas? Another thing that we did is we adopted several common strategies uh, that facilitate language use. We have what was mentioned earlier, interactive notebooks. But it's a structured process where there are Cornell notes taken to piggyback off the average strategies we've done. There's reflection, there's metacognitive strategies based, built in there where students have to go back and re-examine their learning and summarize and create a um, table of contents. But in all of that, uh, using models like 10-2, which is a very common model, but really emphasizing the need for it. So throughout the entire process of learning, students are given ample opportunity to uh, discuss, um, use think, pair, share, but not just the regular elbow partner think, pair, share that, you know, when I was in the classroom where I used, uh, we have a very structured approach. Uh, students are posed questions or comments. They have to write down what their thinking is. They have to listen and actually write down what their partner's thinking is, and then they have to come to consensus and share out and cite evidence from text or from their notes in order to support what they've, they've done. But all of this really came together, starting with the work from Dr. Olson and a grant from the California Community Foundation, and we started at the middle school, because the urgency was we're sending these students to high school and it's affecting their graduation rate. Mm -hmm. And th that was really, when we looked at those numbers and we, we saw you know, what we were helping to contribute to by not addressing it strategically at the middle school level, it, it, it took about a year and the entire school was working strongly and closely and monitoring those students. Thank you, Thank you Kwanzaa. Thank you. Also, I would say at the, at the elementary level, we adopted a two-pronged approach. 
we started looking at designated ELD time. So now at every school, there is a designated ELD time where students receive ELD instruction at their proficiency level. And in addition, um, a lot of all of the, in addition, all of the um, teacher leads just also happen to have been, well, not all of them, in addition to many of them, many of them were also EL liaisons. There is an EL liaison at each site which is a liaison between the site and the ELD or ELL committee. So the focus on the strategies of the language strategies needed to scaffold content instruction for all the EL learners also became a lens by which any kind of staff development that's being delivered is also being delivered behind that ELL lens. So that, te that, that focus never goes away having to scaffold instruction, having to look at the cognitive processes and give students the, the frames needed to be able to work within the cognitive processes with the content standards, um, that is always at the forefront. So in all our staff development now, the, the lens is a language focus first with any strategy that is being taught or implemented. In addition to that, we even at the elementary level, we saw the, L, the need to work with our LTELs starting in the fifth and sixth grade level. Now EL liaisons at each site will um, walk a fifth and sixth grade student through the redesignation process so that they are aware of what is needed from them in order to redesignate. Um, so all our fifth and sixth graders now are aware of the process. That has also gone into parent conferencing where parents are now made aware of the redesignation process so that they realize the urgency um, needed because they need to redesignate um, as they're going, before we want them to redesignate before they go into the middle schools, okay? But so that they are at least aware of what they need to do and what they need to accomplish. Because many times, especially as fifth and sixth graders, they're not really aware and they don't understand that they don't, they're not, doing what they need to be doing. So by giving them that awareness and also the parents, we've had um, a more empowering approach. We've empowered the students and they now know what they need to get done. Not to mention the teachers have also taken on a better learning of what the redesignation process is and what is needed by each student in their classroom to avoid um, a higher LTEL population. We want to minimize that as much as possible. I also think that um, something very important that Mrs. French tapped on earlier is that in our collaboration with California Together and Dr. Lori Olson, we were um, recommended the SEAL program for mm -hmm. early prevention of LTELs, which is the Solano Early Academic Language Program. And our TKK and I think first grade teachers are really excited about the training they're going through this year to um, bring back a biliteracy program as well as guided language acquisition strategies used throughout the day so that not only are our students receiving the specific, level specific ELD time, but that academic language is scaffolded throughout mm -hmm. the day through collaborative work and we are never too young to, in, they're never too young to be introduced to that high academic content vocabulary. We also have guided language acquisition design trainers um, that work with refreshing our teachers who have pretty much all been trained in GLAD strategies in the past um, so that that academic language is echoed throughout the day. We're seeing the urgency because we had the opportunity to, to uh, participate in the shadowing of LTELs in fifth and sixth grade and it was shocking, really shocking and devastating to see our fifth grade students who came to us in kindergarten that are only speaking maybe 2% of the day. And so as a teacher, having the opportunity to see that in a fifth grade classroom, I immediately went back and shared with kinder, first, second, and third grade colleagues that we need to provide language stems, not just during ELD time, not just during think, pair, share time, but during our center rotations. When kids are working on um, standard specific activities, they have little tents with sentence frames. Everywhere they go, there are sentence frames to scaffold them. They're on the walls, they're in their center activities, they're at the writing center, they're everywhere. We need to allow the kids to, op 
the opportunity to talk. Talking is learning and it's critical in Mountain View. Mm -hmm. With 60% ELL and 95% low income, we have to ensure that they're given the opportunity. And that's what's so exciting about the Common Core because kids have to talk. Those are 21st century skills. They have to know how to collaborate, how to think creatively, how to go out and make those connections in the world to be successful you know, and college <coughs> career ready. So we're excited. This, this to us has been very liberating in Mountain View um, to be able to allow our kids to just engage themselves in that high academic language and to hear them on field trips talking about the perimeter of you know, a particular piece of work and engaging in this dialogue with docents at the museum is astounding. Um, it, it's ex an exciting time in education. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be a part of it. I just wanted to touch upon on one more thing about just what you made me think of with inspiring kids to talk and that sort of thing. And then also with our relationship with the elementary or the supervision side of the house. Um, in curriculum, we talked a lot about how it's so important for kids to talk. That translated to kids doing a lot of talking. And so now we're going on these walkthroughs, and great, you know, that's what we're looking for. Kids are talking. And then it dawned on us, what are they talking about? <laughs> and so we started this whole thing about what they're talking about should have great purpose. It should be about topics that are substantial. It should have the academic language. And that's really where we came up with the, the, our, the collaborative discussion rubric is what we're calling it. But it's really to focus on what's the purpose of the talking? Otherwise, you're just going to have a lot of kids talking in the classroom. And I think we kind of saw that mm -hmm. initially, which obviously is the first step. You've got to get them talking. But um, it was a big learn, an aha for all of us to know that, OK, what is the purpose of talking? To build knowledge, to have a more sophisticated language sentence structure. And, and so we're really starting to see that now as the, as the next step. And I think we've also are sharing that responsibility. We're mm -hmm. leveraging some real um, high language strategies with all of our math teachers are mm -hmm. using both math talks and number moves, as well as we also found that uh, while we have a much smaller English learner population, it's definitely concentrated in middle school with long-term English learners. Mm -hmm. And so we have done some intensive training for our middle school teachers, not just in English language arts and math, but in health in history and in science around content literacy strategies and academic language. So um, we have a structure that we've used for four years at grades four and five of EL specialists that have pushed in and really accelerated our students at fourth and fifth grade. And we've seen great success. And so we're now moving those resources up to middle school to provide that extra support there. So one of the requirements uh, for the use of the Common Core money and one of the requirements in the local control funding formulas is that these decisions be made in consultation with the community. And uh, how have you, in Mountain View, how have you worked to engage the community in this process? Well, we, we call it March Madness, <laughs> what, we, <laughs> what we've just experienced. And it, it's been uh, very... Uh, very collaborative, very enlightening, and, and really a wonderful process. Um, what we chose to do was create um, an interactive input session that uh, we have um, had every stakeholder that we can think of experience, from our teachers by school to our uh, classified staff to our evening custodians, uh, our parents, everyone. And we're going to continue the process, even though we're starting to begin that, that writing of the LCAP as well. Um, we also reached out to parents who were not able to, to come to meetings by having a survey. And we also have a student survey. But it has been such uh, an amazing process because people have thanked us um, at every level for the opportunity to give input. And what's been fascinating is that uh, the input has been uh, very consistent no matter which pr uh, different uh, group. So what we did is we had all these groups, um, we trained our, our cabinet to go out and, and do this type of interactive session where they were charting and doing gallery walks and very much like a Common Core compatible strategy. Uh, lots of talk, lots of sharing. 
And then we brought together all those charts and we created uh, a data committee. And the data committee was two, three um, association uh, designated teachers, three CSEA uh, designated employees, and then three administrators. And they came together in a room to verify and to take notes and to create common themes. So, um, and I should, we had two of those um, persons here, and that was uh, Darren and, and Ray, and um, it was uh, a, an amazing process. And so they developed these common themes, and last Saturday we presented them to the school board, who used those, um, those input to really um, adjust and uh, reframe our mission, vision, uh, core values, and really the board, uh, uh, strategies, the board strategic goals. So the board strategic goals now reflect really our LCAP priorities. And from that, we will take that information to um, create our LCAP plan. So it really was uh, a collaborative process. Um, the I think the theme we heard is we want more time. So we're very excited about continuing this process and doing it in the future. Um, I didn't want to give a chance to let these gentlemen say anything in particular about that process. Um, yeah. well, I, I would just echo the, the same sentiment. Uh, Strandry and I were uh, the, the administration who were a part of the, the data collection group. And what we did is we, we broke the group by um, association groups as well as other uh, stakeholders. And we went through the data. And to go through that and to, to work side by side to, re to verify and to look at themes uh, was, was really electric in the room. Uh, everyone involved was very excited about the process. Uh, and yes, as we looked for those common themes, they were definitely there. And through the eight priority area areas, you can see common themes uh, uh, in almost every area were almost identical. And really, really validates uh, the direction that, that we were moving and will continue to move in. And again, uh, being able to synthesize that information and share that out at a board meeting uh, where the board could take a look at that information and see uh, that where we're headed is, is, is on track. And so it was a, it was a really great experience. And uh, being the first time of doing that, it was also very learning for both of us as well. So we did enjoy the learning opportunity. And Jill, uh, in Long Beach, how have you reached out to the community with this work? Um, couple things I can think of, and then I'd, I'd love for Pamela to talk about um, engaging with college faculty in our community. But we all, we have a similar, have used a similar LCAP process um, over the, the last six months, multiple stakeholders involved in narrowing down something like 10,000 data points into a cohesive one-page set of recommendations that really make sense in our community. Um, along, I think in that process, something that emerged that was really meaningful to us when you think about college and career readiness and the skills that we want our students to leave with is that that process involved students, in particular high school students. And what really happened in the room at the LCAP meetings was that our students became the table facilitators and conversed with adults and led conversations and really um, gave a, a first-hand perspective about why the things that were being talked about as part of the LCAP planning were important to them as students in our district. And to me, that was a highlight to witness. Obviously, the adult conversation was important, but to see the, the alignment of those things come together was very special. Another uniqueness in our community has really been about college engagement. So, Pamela, would you? Yeah. Because we have a, a, a long-standing, seamless partnership with our neighboring community college, Long Beach City College, as well as Cal State Long Beach. And we've approached our work with Common Core with them with an eye to addressing the needs of our graduating students, the handoff that we will give when we have um, done our work with our seniors, as well as the students that those institutions are sending back to us as teachers in our district. So um, we have, are in our fourth year of our college faculty symposium, which is where staff from the Unified School District, as well as the City College and Cal State, come together, together to do collaborative study on the instructional shifts and the shifts in assessments that our students will be encountering with Common Core. So it's been a real learning together as well as a sharing of resources. 
Um, we're very excited that next month we'll be doing a study on performance tasks and actually taking this, the faculty from the three institutions through the experience of a real world application based performance task. We also have been working through our bits and induction program as well as some of the members of our curriculum staff teach the methods courses at Cal State Long Beach. The idea is that the majority of our teachers that come into our system go through preparation at Cal State Long Beach and we want to be really thoughtful and deliberate in preparing them to come in equipped to teach in our system from the minute they hit the classroom. Hey, I, I have a lot more questions, but uh, at this point, I'd like to open it to the floor if there are questions from you all that you'd like to pose either to Long Beach or to Mountain View. Yes, please. That's actually K-5 at this time. We've maintained our, our report cards or our grades at secondary, but not at elementary. Awesome. Yeah, and, and I've, I've been asked if, if you would approach the microphone, then, then we can, or we can, ask the, we can ask the panelists to repeat the question. That's probably easier. Um, she's asking if the rubric that we have developed is on the website. It, um, I believe we have it on our internal website at this time, the intranet, but it's certainly something that we can share. A lot of the work that we, we, re we researched several different, you know, we looked up rubrics and we, we looked up um, discussion and speaking and listening. And one of the big influential factors into it, though, was the work from Jeff Zwiers. Mm -hmm. He's out of Stanford and has done a lot. I'm, I, I want to say it right. Is it the academic? It's collaborative. Academic interactions or something like that. But we were able to listen to him speak, and he had a lot of great resources. So you'll, you'll kind of see pieces of all of that throughout it. But um, I guess we could put that on our, there wouldn't be any reason not to have it on the intra internet on our website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, yes, please. We're continuing with the tradition. The question was, what math sequence are we using? And we'll be following a traditional sequence. Um, the Almani Union High School District that we fit into uh, is using an integrated approach. And so we're supporting that as well. It, it, it's integrated one through four. The question was about uh, career technical education. And so our approach to career technical e education is that we're preparing our students to be both college and career ready. And so you will see um, career tech educational courses in our district that are aligned to pathways. Uh, we are a linked learning district. And those um, courses, many of them have UC approval. We have infused common core literacy strategies into all of those, as well as focusing on the math in those that are appropriate STEM CTE courses. Um, considering I was one of those students who didn't realize I was going to go to college till my <laughs> senior year, uh, we kind of take the philosophy that every student has an opportunity because we're in K-8 district. At the middle school level, we've implemented Project Lead the Way, which is a nationally recognized STEM program to give them exploration opportunities uh, at the middle school level. In addition, our local high schools have the same courses, and um, in a year or so, once they're certified, students will be able to earn college credit in those courses at the high school level. So even if they choose to go to a four-year university or a career, a career technical path, uh, they can go into a, one of our local uh, colleges or any junior college with some credits with them. That also comes because we're part of the Almani Promise. Uh, in Elmani, any student who graduates from a high school in the, in the Elmani Union High School District, as long as they meet their A through G requirements, they get automatic admission to Cal State LA. They get priority registration their first year at Rio Hondo and Pasadena City College. And any students who graduate in the top 3% of their class uh, get automatic admission to UC Irvine. 
So we are trying to look at the middle school level uh, at offering things that are a wide variety so they can ex explore their interest and see education no matter what that might be uh, post high school as an option for them. I would like to add that this Friday we have a funders briefing and a, um, a signing ceremony that the, that the that formal partnership used to be just with the Almonte High School District and now we recognize that the K-8 districts have to be an important part of that. So uh, there will be a formal signing of the El Monte districts, El Monte City and ourselves and El Monte Union and, and uh, Rio Hondo, Cal State Los Angeles and UC Irvine as uh, formal partners. And one of the important parts of it is also to provide families with financial literacy and with um, funding opportunities so that uh, we're establishing a scholar um, savings program which begins in first grade, so at the end of uh, their graduating year in high school, they will have a scholarship. Every student will have a scholarship that they can take with them to, to uh, fund their college or career. Oh. <laughs> we just want to add can we more. add one more thing? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously this is, this is a really near and dear to our hearts project yeah. is that we start focus on, on college and career for our kids. And part of that, uh, as we've come together with multiple districts in our city, uh, to really look at what are the milestones in, beginning at kindergarten. What do we do from kindergarten all the way through getting kids prepared for uh, a college-going type of uh, mindset? So, um, again, this is uh, if you have the opportunity to look at that, it's it's quite the unique opportunity for for kids in our city. Yes, please. Uh, and please repeat the question. Um, so how have we been able to fund um, freeing up instructional time or, or, or professional development time? For the past five years, it's been a true challenge. And um, I've done it by establishing partnerships and um, grant writing. And any, anyone who is willing to come partner with us and fund, uh, we have uh, grants from Walmart. We have grants from the California Community Foundation. We have grants from Kaiser Permanente. We have grants from any number of sources because um, it was very truly challenging to um, fund professional development in, in such a difficult financial uh, crisis and difficult to be laying off people and, and, and funding that as well. So um, we did everything we could to, to find monies for that. And so the Common Core funding that came just at the right time so that we were able to really um, gear up what we were doing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and also, as we mentioned earlier, <coughs> principals had all of the training a year prior to implementation with staff, so it really made us examine how we use our staff meeting time. Uh, so really, we became the facilitators of staff development in many ways, so that way um, we, you know, example my, my site, uh, we have one staff meeting a month and we have three PD days a month. Uh, scaffolded between different departments, which allows them for professional learning time, as well as ongoing professional development. And it, it really helps to, one, it emphasizes that this is what we do, and it also emphasizes that, you know, it, we're not expecting you to get it in one shot. Mm -hmm. it, there's ongoing support throughout the year. Okay, and in Long Beach? was deployed to school sites to um, do some sense making and have release time for their teachers. So while there's many aspects of our implementation that have been kept very tight and used in a trainer of trainer models, um, the money that went out to the sites that's Common Core money has allowed departments to have release time collaboration with or without their principal, have, has allowed district curriculum staff to go out to a school and work with a team of teachers that's trying to refine one specific area of their craft. Um, has allowed to be in addition to the four hours of required staff meeting time, has just really changed what the day looks like, including after school paid planning time. So those resources have really, I think, been the loose part of our tight implementation is it's, it's created some space for teachers and their principals to really converse and collaborate and, and plan for the use of these uh, materials that have been so 
meaningful for our teachers. And, and another aspect that you really hit on, the, the time within the school day for teachers to do this work is really critical. And we have been the very fortunate recipients of a grant from the Gates Foundation focusing on innovative professional development. And we have conceptualized that to be an augmentation of our very successful face-to-face -face professional development by um, using technology to leverage time and providing a professional learning management system where anyone in the system can access communities of practice, can access online professional development as either follow-up to something that was presented face-to-face -face or to extend the collaboration across districts, um, across sites, and can be done um, on demand. We've also just begun to engage in some work that's supported by the Gates Foundation around looking at master schedules and leveraging time using um, some pretty sophisticated software that's beyond my ability to explain <laughs> that takes into account all of the things that go into a master schedule and timing and, and attempts to look at carving out time during the school day for teachers to either do face-to-face -face or use an innovative uh, technology system. We've now arrived at the most complicated part of the program, which is the break. Just the other side of the freeway from that uh, area. Awesome. Welcome back from the break. And wasn't that a fabulous panel? A great district. I think there's so much work to celebrate and recognize as we move forward on this journey. Two of the themes that came up a great deal as we talked about the data, as we talked about the work that districts were doing, were communications and professional development. And we have a second panel for you at this point to be able to talk more about both of those topics with you. And I'd like to welcome Monica Liu from the Gates Foundation and Brian Guerrero, who is from Lenox School District and from CTA. So welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so I'm a consultant with the Gates Foundation, but also an LA native, so super happy to be here. Oh, thank there you. There you go. I can get up here, I suppose. Perfect. Um, I'd like to talk to everyone about two things today, and they really kind of converge upon um, the same question, which is really how do you get the right people around the table as you embark on implementation? So when you're really looking for um, how to engage your stakeholders, messaging is absolutely critical. So we'll share some of our work around that. Um, when you're looking for partners to actually help you on the ground, you need great technical assistance providers. So I will also share uh, some of the work that we've done on that front. So we have partnered um, with a number of funders uh, in California to support the CDE in implementing a grant around communicating the Common Core here in this state. But we've also done quite a bit of work around the country um, in discovering the types of messages that actually work really well um, among tons of different stakeholders. So I just wanted to share a quick overview of some of the things that we've learned. Um, these are the positive messages that we found are really effective. And I know that they sound like ones that you've heard before, but I think that the message that we want to send is that these are actually the correct ones to be telling people about. And it's not that the positive messages are not effective. Um, there are just a lot of um, negative messages going around that are very distracting as well. So I think um, it's really about staying the course with this and not getting off message, not um, going too far towards just dispelling myths and, and responding to negative critics. It's really about staying true to these. So the first one, the Common Core prepares students for success in college and career. Um, this focus on post-secondary readiness uh, seems very obvious to us within the education reform community, but it is something that we really need to continue emphasizing. Teachers strongly support the standards. This is actually something that I think is one of the greatest assets that we have, um, that the people who are responsible for bringing this out actually are really on board with this, and all they really need is, is a lot of great support um, in implementation. But in terms of the concept and the idea that we should be moving forward, teachers are on board. High expectations for all students ensure equal access to a quality education and a chance for all students to succeed. This really drives at the equity and access point that a lot of stakeholders are very concerned about. And it's very important to include that in all of your conversations. 
Um, the rest of these I'll let you read. Um, they really feed into the three that I just mentioned. Um, I would point out at the bottom, if you have examples in your district or school or even just a building of the Common Core already working, um, that is really something that can be extremely powerful. So find someone that your colleague would know who is actually doing really great work in their classroom around Common Core um, and really spread that message around. I'd like to focus a little bit on teachers here. They really are the most important voices in this conversation, not just as an audience for your message, but really as messengers for you. Um, they're the most networked in with all the other stakeholders that you want to reach, whether they're parents or students or the business community um, or just taxpayers in general. Um, and really making sure that you equip them with the tools that they need to actually implement Common Core as well as be ambassadors for the Common Core message is extremely important. So one way that you could make this concrete, um, we have survey data that shows that parents are actually very concerned around whether teachers have the tools that they need to implement Common Core and whether they have the training uh, to really understand what this means and to deliver it to students. Um, you can really task teachers with actually spreading the message about the kinds of training that they're getting, um, how they're being prepared, uh, and, and how they're observing that Common Core is changing instruction on students in front of them in classrooms. So I know that was quick, um, but I'm happy to share some more of the work that we have offline. Moving to the next topic, um, when you implement Common Core, you obviously need really great technical assistance partners. And so we've done a little bit of work in developing a taxonomy or a framework of sorts to really help you understand what type of technical assistance you might need um, and also who might be able to help you do that. So I want to go over very quickly um, what we think that technical assistance is and perhaps more importantly, what it is not. So I have a couple definers down here. The first one is that technical assistance needs to be customized to the local context and not completely off the shelf. So a lot of the times technical assistance gets confused with just pure product. It's not something that you buy um, and push into a classroom. At its very core, it's a service with some level of support and customization. Technical assistance also needs to actively build the ability um, of the local team to drive the work on its own and not actually just provide information or events. So anything that is really just advocacy or convening um, or knowledge sharing, that's not necessarily going to qualify. It's not talking about what it is that you need to do, but how you actually need to get there. Lastly, technical assistance needs to have the expectation of being temporary. As a district, you obviously have all of the core capabilities necessary to carry this forward and you need to continue to own that work. So um, a huge piece of technical assistance for us is that it builds capacity um, for whoever the client is and uh, doesn't substitute for that. So we've really looked at six different types of technical assistance that we think that most um, of Common Core fits under. So the first is design and implementation planning. And this is really uh, just strategy development. So this is helping a district essentially develop a plan for how to transition from whatever standards they have now to the new Common Core standards. And it includes everything from communication strategies to timelines to um, uh, stakeholder engagement plans. Um, all of that is included there. Under policy development, this is really thinking about um, what the policy shifts are going to be at the district and at the state level and how they're going to impact how your school operates um, on a daily level. An example for Common Core um, might be how the new assessments are actually going to impact how your school accountabil uh, accountability results come out. Tool and resource development is a big one, probably one that you've been bombarded with uh, by providers in the past. These are folks who develop curriculum modules um, that are aligned to Common Core. Uh, on the training and coaching side, this is really about making sure that everybody on your team is um, on board and trained to be able to actually carry out this Common Core effort. So training is a lot more about group knowledge transfer. This is teaching large groups of teachers about what the instructional shifts required of Common Core are, um, and some of this is often delivered by an outside provider. Uh, coaching is a lot more personalized and really about skill development. This is driving into the classroom and helping individual principals and teachers understand what the shifts look like on their students and in their classrooms um, and in families. 
The last one is implementation project management. This is kind of the most consultancy of the ones uh, listed here. This is really just about making sure that you're staying on timeline, you're staying on budget, um, and making any course and time adjustments um, along the way as you see necessary. So we did a little bit of work um, around the country around thinking about how we can actually make this taxonomy helpful to folks. Uh, so we did quite a bit of survey research of about 80 district and state leaders across the country around how they would use this taxonomy and who they're actually engaging in this space. And what you see up here is um, a technical assistance map for the state of Colorado, uh, the list of partners that they engaged to help them with Common Core. So I wanted to point out a couple things about this. You'll see that there is no one listed under policy development. And that really drives at a point that we really believe in that you know, you don't need technical assistance prov providers across the entire gamut of work that you're doing. Um, that part of being really successful with this is doing a very honest and deep needs assessment around what your core capabilities are and what you need help with. In the case of Colorado, um, they had plenty of in-house capacity in terms of policy development, so they did not need to bring anyone in um, for that. Um, on the training and coaching side, you'll see that there are four providers who actually span both of those types of technical assistance. Um, and you'll see over time that there are providers out there who can actually help you with more than one type of technical assistance, but that there is, it's very unlikely that there will be a um, provider who's going to be equally effective across all of them. So we wanted to give you some tools just for understanding um, how to evaluate partners and where to really fit them in. The other thing I would point out is, again, this in-house versus external um, balance. From our survey data, we found that about 80% of the districts that we surveyed were using an outside provider for training, and only 40% of them were using someone for coaching. So you'll see things that are a little bit closer to the classroom and more personalized being kept within the district, and things that are more um, amenable to outsourcing uh, being repurposed for that. So the last thing I wanted to go over um, is a quick framework that we've developed just to really guide you with partner selection and evaluation. And this is something that we're definitely um, still collecting feedback on, and I would absolutely love some, some thoughts on this. So I think on the first front, you really need a technical assistant provider that has expertise. I know that at this point, there is no such thing as common core expertise because we're all essentially in the same boat. Um, but really thinking about, are you bringing on someone who actually knows something um, that can really help you? Do they have a highly specialized domain focus, whether it's around reorganizing time for professional development or something else? Do they have experience driving large-scale change efforts? Do they have a best practice solution or something close to it that they can actually bring to scale in a district of your size? Um, I think what's really important, can the partner build consensus at all levels of an organization? You need someone who's going to be working side by side with your in-house team on uh, really messaging out to a bunch of different stakeholders, and you need them to really become part of the community. On the resource front, um, that's pretty basic. Basically, do you have people on the technical assistance team who are qualified um, and respected within the field? Um, do they have the bandwidth to flex their team resources when you need it? We're obviously on a tight timeline um, and on an even tighter resource scheme. So really thinking about whether that partner is able to, to flex with you in that sense as well. And sustainability. This one seems obvious, but it's actually extremely important. Um, is the partner essentially going to be around in five years when you're still implementing Common Core and their contract is over? So really thinking about whether this organization has the capability to support you and to support itself. So this is just some of the information that we've gathered today. Um, we're still finishing up some of this work on the back end, but I'm really looking forward to getting some information from you all um, about how you might be using this taxonomy, what might be helpful to you, um, and what you're learning moving forward. So thanks. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, um, good morning still, I guess. Uh, my name is Brian Guerrero. Uh, I'm a middle school teacher in Lenox, which is kind of down uh, the, the Imperial, down at uh, the 405, right there by the airport. 
I'm also uh, fortunate enough to be the president of the Linux Teachers Association, our, our uh, CTA affiliate. Um, and I'm just going to give a little bit of information today for everybody about CTA's role in Common Core and kind of the development um, of, of teachers and then some other programs. Um, CTA has really been involved with the Common Core from the beginning. Um, you know, NEA, it's a national, Common Core is really a national effort. Um, you know, NEA, the National Educators Association, has been involved with it. CTA has been involved with uh, other state organizations really from its inception. Um, here in California for the last couple of years, CTA has really been working in a couple of different areas. Uh, probably the most noticeable to folks is a, a massive professional development push. Um, CTA has really recognized, and teachers have really recognized, this was mentioned before, teachers by and large uh, support Common Core. Um, it really is the way we should be teaching. Um, it's something we all recognize when we see the Common Core standards, or the Common Core expectations. We know that's what we should be doing with our students. That's what we want for our own children and things like that. Unfortunately, it's not necessarily what we've been doing in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, the last few decades have really seen an overfocus on certain types of testing and certain types of evaluation. Um, you know, and, and despite resistance and things like that, at some point, uh, and to, to varying degrees, that's really what everybody's kind of adapted to, the old, you know, standardized testing, multiple choice testing, and things like that. So people have really tried to maintain as much solid good teaching in there as they can, but it's absolutely affected just the choices people have to make, uh, particularly in places the district where I teach, there are a couple of program improvement schools, you know, and you're judged and evaluated and, and determined to be a success or a failure by how you measured up to some of those, those standards. Um, so CTA has been doing a lot of work uh, with veteran teachers, really trying to remind them that, you know, you know how to teach. You know, you've got a history of teaching integrated units, student-centered units, units that, that really bring uh, students into the picture and engage their, their learning, engage their interests, uh, that are very rigorous. Um, also working with new teachers. You know, some new teachers have been fortunate enough to have that kind of experience over the last couple of years, but there are some new teachers who've really come into this profession under a very scripted kind of model um, and the Common Core can be really scary for them. Um, the Common Core can be really scary for a lot of people who have kind of been pushed into a certain style of teaching. So CTA has been working very uh, diligently trying to get everybody engaged in that. A couple examples of CTA work. Um, CTA hosts the, the Summer Institute at UCLA every summer. It's a week-long, uh, very intensive institute. Uh, in Westwood at UCLA. It's got a number of different strands, some kind of association strands, but for the last three years, it has had a major strand on instruction and professional development about the Common Core. There are hundreds of teachers who, going back um, as far as, as 2011 and, and even earlier, who've been trained by CTA in Common Core, the expectations um, as they've evolved, the different aspects of it, whether it's testing, um, whether it's uh, just the, the different parts of the standards and the shifts and things like that. Um, one of the nice things about the Common Core Institutes at, at the Summer Institute is administrators often attend that as well. Uh, principals, uh, district administrators, school board members have uh, attended that. So CTA has really been at the forefront of trying to bring everybody along and get everybody on the same page with that. Um, CTA hosts two conferences every year called Good Teaching one in Northern California, one in Southern California. The Southern California Good Teaching Conference was about two weeks ago in Anaheim, and that's another one where there's, there's good teaching is, is driven both by CTA's instructional staff um, and also instructional professional development staff, but also teachers from the classroom bringing successful units, bringing successful strategies, and sharing that with teachers and, and other people who come to that. So uh, the Good Teaching Conference has been a big deal. Um, also, we do a lot of smaller workshops. We've got Norma Sanchez here with us today, um, and, and some other CTA staff have been doing smaller kind of district size or regional workshops involving Common Core. And when I say smaller, it's smaller than some of these big conferences, but some of them still have hundreds and hundreds of attendees sharing what's been working, sharing their strategies, and getting some of their, their latest information through CTA about the Common Core. Um, all of these focus on good teaching. Um, and again, I, I do want to go back to that message that, that teachers recognize that what is being asked for in the Common Core is good teaching. And it's getting back to that. Um, it's re-emphasizing that over some of the, the practices that have become kind of the norm over the last few years. Um, CTA has also really worked with districts on this. This is, 
you know, sometimes CTA and, and teachers associations have a, a reputation for adversarial relationships or disagreeing with school districts about things. Um, you know, the last couple of years have been tough with funding and things. Uh, but Common Core is something where we really all have the same interests. And it's getting that good teaching, uh, you know, to, to its peak, uh, really working with students and, and helping the students shine through all of this. So CTA, whether it's just including administrators and district staff and school administrations in the conferences, in the trainings, or actually coming in and working with some districts and helping districts uh, find out, you know, the direction they want to go. That's one of the ways that I've gotten involved with this. Um, talking about CTA and, and Common Core, you also really have to look at some of the antecedents of CTA's relationship with this. One of those is the QEIA program, Quality Instruction Improvement Act. Um, back in 2006, CTA was involved with a, a lawsuit with then Governor Schwarzenegger about getting a fair amount of money back into the school system that, that the, uh, the state had pulled out at that point. Um, the result was the QEIA program. QEI, one of the main achievements of the QEI program was for uh, participating schools to really lower the sizes of classes. Um, a lot of schools participate in class size reduction, less in the last couple of years, but QEI really held schools that were participating to that low ratio in their K through three classrooms. And it also recognized that smaller classes are very important in upper grades, so there were also class limitations uh, and funding to do that for fourth through 12th grades. Um, there were also, for some of the high schools, counselor ratios um, and making sure that there are enough counselors uh, to service the students. Um, it also provided some money to do some other uh, innovative things in the schools, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but CTA recognized early on that this opportunity of having some funding wasn't going to happen very often or, or very, uh, you know, very often. And so one of the things that CTA and their wisdom decided to do was bring in some outside evaluators. Um, they brought in a group that had nothing to do with CTA to monitor the uh, implementation of the QAA program. Um, and watch it, see where it was succeeding, see where it was not succeeding, um, and just kind of keep track of this. Seven years later, the results are in from that study, and there's a number of very important findings about the QEIA program that help us look forward to both the implementation of Common Core and another, you know, the local control funding formula that's been brought up several times today. Um, first of all, obviously, class size does matter. Um, the schools that were able to implement those smaller classes and stick with them throughout have had market uh, success. Um, funding matters. A um, couple other things with that extra funding that was available. Teacher-driven professional development. Um, teachers largely know what they need to be successful in the classroom. You know, districts certainly have the initiatives and things that they want everybody to be a part of, but teachers understand what their students need. They understand as professionals a lot of times um, what they need to grow and to service their students. So teacher-driven professional development really kind of marked the highly successful QEI schools with the less successful QEI schools. Uh, regular teacher collaboration. That's been something that was brought up a number of times on the panel today. Teachers need to talk with each other, whether it's across their grade level, whether it's across multiple grade levels. Uh, if you've got multiple schools in the area, teachers at different schools collaborating with each other. Um, but just teacher collaboration and having regular, not just once a month, not just when there's time, but having teacher collaboration and opportunities for teachers to share and reflect on what has been successful. Um, Targeted intervention was another characteristic of very successful QEIA schools. Having ways of identifying and servicing struggling students very early um, and not letting them kind of linger in the system. Um, also having principals as instructional leaders, and that's something I think we saw today with the panels too. Having principals that are engaged in the instruction, that are engaged in not just the administrative side of their job, but, but who see themselves and have the capacity to contribute to the instructional decisions and the instruction at their schools. Um, those findings really do drive CTA, and particularly in my local, our approach to local control funding in the LCAP, as well as the Common Core. Um, in our district, last year, we established a Common Core implementation committee with the, the school district. Um, it consists of five teachers. It includes three principals, and it includes the director of instruction for our district. And this committee of nine people is what makes the decisions about that Common Core implementation money in our district. And we heard varying degrees of teacher participation in the actual decision making. Um, and Ms. Liu talked a lot about the importance of having teachers involved in advocating for Common Core and being kind of 
uh, liaisons with the community and the public about how important this is, but it's also important to have teachers involved in the decision making about how this will happen. Um, in our own district, that means that as we talk about how to use the Common Core money and how to make decisions about going forward with Common Core, we really look back at the results of QEIA, making sure that teacher-driven professional development is a part of Common Core preparation, uh, coaching to make sure that teachers are supported as needed. Collaboration must be a part of the Common Core implementation. Also helping to the principals to become instructional leaders. Um, some teachers, uh, just like teachers, some principals have kind of come into the profession or come into the role in the last couple of years under a very different set of expectations um, and making sure that they, they see themselves and have the ability to be instructional leaders. It also really affects our LCAP committee, you know, Common Core and the writing of the uh, local control accountability plan uh, are hand in hand. Uh, more focus on professional development, really emphasizing as we make decisions about how we'll be using implementing local control that the smaller classes have benefited our students. Um, the district where I teach, it's about 50% at this point English learners, uh, it's 96% free and reduced lunch, it's 94% Latino, um, then there's a, a, a large group compared to the 96. Um, you know, about four or five percent African American and Tongan, Pacific Islanders. Um, you know, so this is a, a community that's got a lot of needs and having those class sizes where we can give the individualized attention, the individualized feedback, and devote uh, the, the, the resources to those students is very important. Um, also the effective intervention. You know, QEIA identified having intervention programs as being key and not allowing students to get through the system and go years and years. You know, the, the early intervention with the LTELs was identified early. Having those types of interventions and plans is something that we are really pushing to make sure happens in the uh, LCAP committee. One other thing that I wanted to talk about, CTA's involvement. Over the years, CTA has provided locals with a lot of training about organizing, uh, whether it's you know, bargaining and things like that, getting out and talking to the members and how to do that. We're really using that same training now to make sure that different stakeholder groups are involved in decisions about Common Core and decisions about the LCAP. Um, We've been running focus groups with teachers, visiting all the school sites in the district and having what are called small group meetings um, with the teachers about what kind of supports do you need, what kind of changes do you want to see, what kind of things you want to have happen under Common Core. Uh, we've been doing the same thing, outreaching to parents. Um, the district is doing a lot of the interactive meetings with parents. The attendance is pretty good, but it's, it's always hard to get parents to those kind of things. The district has kind of the technological side. They've created a, a web page and a, a particular email address where parents can email their ideas about Common Core and things like that. But one of the things that the Teachers Association has that the district doesn't is, you know, manpower and woman power and, and just a, a number of bodies. And so we've been having teachers go out and have focus groups with the, te the, the parents and talk to them around the simple question of what would make Lenox a better place to teach and learn over the next couple of years. And the ideas that we're getting from the parents and the conversation we're having with parents have been absolutely fabulous. And a lot of cases, they mirror the things that the teachers have identified as being beneficial, but sometimes the parents have ideas that we wouldn't even think about, uh, or a different angle on an idea that we something that we thought might be important, but we weren't sure how much, but the parents, you know, that's what matters to them, and that's what they believe is gonna help their students. So we've really been trying to partner with the district to reach out to those stakeholders, involve them in the Common Core planning, involve them in the LCAP planning. Um, just in closing, um, CTA has mostly been involved uh, with professional development side of things, uh, but, and really trying to reach a large audience with that but also with capacity building to have the teachers involved in the decision making in a meaningful way with Common Core implementation. Um, also on, on helping us to make sure that all of our stakeholders are involved in the process. And finally, uh, giving us uh, good data to reflect on from programs like QEIA about things that have worked in the past, in the recent past, that we should be using as kind of touchstones and models as we go forward. So thank you very much.
Well, we're reaching um, our part five here, our uh, six actually of our resources, and we're going to be going over some resources with you shortly. But we brought two of them in person, and one of them is uh, Gina Quincy. She's a fellow from the uh, senior fellow from the California Department of Education. She's going to give you some resources on assessment, something that is very close and near and dear to our heart now that we're in the test of the test. And then Dr. Uh, Fred Uwe, who is uh, one of our partners. We talked about partnerships with uh, institutions of higher learning, and he's going to talk about a very important partnership that we've had with uh, Cal State LA um, County Office and a number of school districts. So right now, I'm going to introduce Dr. Gina Quincy. Thank you, Yvonne. Here's the pull this up. Okay. Oh, good. Well, hello. And it's really nice to be back. I don't know. Um, I see some familiar faces because I worked at LACO for 10 years. So this is like coming back home, which has been very nice. Thank you. Um, about Smarter Balanced and the field test. You know, today is a big day for us, and we're all like watching our emails and checking our messages and our voicemails to see if we're getting any questions, concerns from the field. We were supposed to start last year, I mean last week, with the field test, but they delayed it by a week, um, and with good reason. And it was the larger consortia that did the, requested the delay. When you think about millions of students going online and testing at the same time, they felt they needed one more week to test things out. And I can understand that. I, I would certainly feel that way, too. So they delayed it by a week. So we start today. And you may have seen the state superintendent put out an announcement recently. This morning, I think it came out, about the field test beginning today. I am now a, a new title. I have been called a senior assessment fellow, although I'm not too sure I like that word senior in front of my name. I'd rather just be an assessment fellow. Um, there are four of us. Deb Sigmund, who's the Deputy Superintendent for Public Instruction, saw what a great job Nancy Brownell was doing for the Common Core, because she is the state fellow for the Common Core. And so she decided one is good, but four would be even better. So she contacted four of us and brought us in as assessment fellows. There are two of us up north and two of us down here in the Southern California area. She wanted us to be geographically close to the districts that we serve. So that, you know, if people need something, we can get out there as quickly as possible. So I do live in the LA County area, um, and I am spending a lot of my time going out and talking to districts and working with them one-on-one um, -on -one to support them as they move forward with this field test. Oops, not the right way. There we go. Um, I was gonna start by giving you an update on the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, which you know is the testing system that has essentially replaced the STAR program. So you'll hear us refer to the system as CASP. That's the new acronym instead of STAR. Um, and I was gonna give you a little bit of an update also on the Smarter Balance Field Test, but I'm just gonna just touch very briefly on those two slides because I really wanna move to the slides with the resources that are available to support you. Again, we started today, and you know that CASP right now is essentially focusing on the smarter balance component, which is English language arts and mathematics at grades three through eight and grade 11. Um, there will, and there are aspects of STAR that have stayed in place this year, such as CAPA has stayed in place, as well as the um, CMA in science, and the early assessment program, which is optional, and the standards-based test in Spanish. Now, these tests have stayed in place for this year. Um, we don't have yet any clear direction on when they will change, but we anticipate there are going to be some changes with those aspects of the testing program. In terms of the field test, we started today. Um, and right now, school districts have been assigned one of four six-week six week windows, and it's actually schools have been assigned those windows. How many of you have schools in window one? In window one? Okay, not too many. All right, window one is probably the window with the fewest number of schools assigned, um, and window two will start on April 7th. So it's not too far off before we'll see a, a significant jump in the number of schools that will start the field test. 
there are some details here also about which students, um, but this information is available online, so I'm going to skip through it and go directly to the resources that are available. Uh, let me talk. I wish I could, I can take this mic off, right? I hate to stand behind this thing. I don't think so. I think it's... Uh, okay. Well, I guess I have to stand. I'd rather walk, but I'll stand. All right. Remember that the field test is a computer-based test. It's not yet computer adaptive and only computer-based right now. There is no paper, pencil version of the field test. Now, next year, when it goes operational, there will be, for two or three years, I believe it's three years, a paper, pencil version of the test available. Um, so when it becomes computer adaptive, there will also be a paper, pencil. But right now, for the field test, it's all computer-based. Um, also, another key thing to keep in mind is that there will be no reports this year, okay? No student level reports, no school level reports, no district level reports. All the information is going back to Smarter Balance and they'll be using it to evaluate the test questions and make decisions about the test questions. In all likelihood, there will be a, some kind of summary report about this field test. There was a report about the pilot test last year that you may wanna check out on the Smarter Balance website. And similarly, we expect we'll see one for this field test. And I've put the URL up here for the California Department of Education Smarter Balance Field Test webpage. This webpage was recently updated. You can access it from the California Department of Education main webpage if you go to cde.ca.gov and go down toward the middle, toward the bottom, you will see a link to the Smarter Balance Field Test page. And that's the link that will take you and give you direct access to quite a few things that are available out there to support schools and districts with the Smarter Balanced implementation. So the resources. And I hate, you know, the reality is there's a lot of resources out there. You know, we meet, the fellows meet with the department periodically to go over all the resources that are available because part of our job is to identify where the needs are. When we get out and talk to schools and districts, we come back, we meet with the department, we talk about what we hear the needs are, and then we determine, you know, let's get it done and who's going to get it done. So we're the ears and the eyes uh, of the school districts and get that information back to the Department of Education. But the other part of our job is to make sure schools and districts are aware of the resources that are, that are out there and what are the most useful and valuable resources that are there for you. So this is a look at the Smarter Balance field test webpage. Since I took this screenshot last week, it's already changed. Um, I'm the one that monitors this webpage and is constantly updating and sending messages to the webmaster at the department. We need to add this, we need to do this. So we're constantly keeping it up to date. And one of the things that's already changed, and I hate to step away, but I'm, I might have to. Can you hear me in the back? I won't be able to pick you up on the... Oh, okay, all right, darn, okay, I have to stay here. All right, um, I know as a teacher, it's really hard to stay in one place for, for very long, but anyway, um, if you look at this website here, at the screenshot, down where it says communication and resources search, now you're gonna find a link to the flashes. Have you seen those flashes? Are you on the listserv to get those flashes? All right, what the department started doing is because we realized there was so much information coming out and we needed to get it out quickly, is that they created this field test flash. And so it comes out just about every week. It's short, but it just identifies what are the most essential things that are, that are happening with respect to the field test that schools and districts need to know about. Now, there's actually now you'll see a link to those flashes so you can see, I think there's 12 or 13 of them that have gone out already. Another thing is that if you're not getting the flashes, you can. There is a listserv. And if you go to that link right under the Smarter Balance field test updates and send them an, an email, you will get a, on the list for the flashes and other information about Smarter Balance. And so we encourage you, if you haven't signed up already, to do so. The other link here is the one at the, the very first one under the Smarter Balance field test portal. If you click on that one, that's going to take you to the portal that is being maintained by Educational Testing Service. 
And I'm going to go there in just a minute and show you a few screenshots. There are a lot of great resources on californiatech.org, which is what it's called. And there's a little box there to the field test portal that you need to be aware of and be accessing on a regular basis. Finally, the other big improvement to this web page are the tabs along the bottom. Before, you know, if you were a parent, you didn't know where the parent resources were. Or if you were a teacher, you didn't know specifically what resources were available for you. So what we've done is we've reorganized them by audience. There's duplication. Some of the things on the administrator tab you're going to see on the teacher tab. You may see on the parent tab. But we tried to go through and really identify the primary audience and make sure that that was really clearly spelled out in those tabs. And like I said, it's a work in progress. These things are evolving every day. There is a really nice field test overview video. And in fact, if you go to YouTube, you're going to find a lot of our videos are up there, too. Um, and this one I particularly like. It's not very long, nine minutes. And I think that it gives you a nice overview of the field test. This one, I feel, is very appropriate for teachers and for parents. These are among my favorite. Have any of you seen the videos for middle school and high school students? OK. Yeah, those are really nice. Um, there is one that's coming for elementary school students. Um, I saw the script last week. We reviewed it. And that's part of our role, again, as fellows. We review and edit a lot of the scripts and the materials that are getting developed. And so I'm hoping, fingers crossed, by next week we'll see something up for elementary school students, because it's really cute, too. These videos are great for students, and they're great for parents. So I encourage you to share it with them. Um, in one school district I work with, we put a link up to these videos right on the home page. And it's, it's really great. Parents are getting them. Smarter Balance provides accessibility for all students to the field test. And they do have a guide to their usability, accessibility, and accommodations guidelines. They have universal tools. They have de designated supports. And they have accommodations. And those are either embedded in the technology or they're non-embedded. And we really want people to access the guides, access the Qs and As, access the resources that are available. The Department of Education also recently put up their version of the matrix of uh, accommodations for students with disabilities and English learners. This is on, if you go to the Department of Education, you go to testing and accountability, and then you go to student testing, you will find this matrix. And I've used them both. I've used the Smarter Balance Guide, and I've used this matrix. I really like this matrix. At first, when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, there's a lot of stuff here. But the more I've dug into this matrix, the more I really like it. And I'm finding it, it's very, very user friendly. So I encourage you to take a look at it. Again, there is a kind of a lengthy video. I think it's almost about an hour in length. It's been archived. There was a webinar that was done by the Department of Education in conjunction with ETS about the accommodations for students with disabilities. Um, this is the link that will take you to that webinar. And again, you can, you know, I probably we all are guilty of it. I'll just look at parts of it and then kind of skip over the parts that I think I may not be as interested. And it is kind of long. One hour is pretty lengthy. Um, I would say the part, I, to me, the best part and the most interesting for me was listening to the Department of Education, Shobhan Arishi, who is their consultant in charge of students with disabilities, to talk about the accommodations that are available on Smarter Balanced. This is CaliforniaTAC.org. And I'm on this web page every day. And in fact, they're constantly changing it, too. One of the things that changed just since I took this screenshot over the weekend is that now this portal has been moved. It used to be down toward the bottom of the page. Now it's right up at that top of CaliforniaTech.org. And that's the box that you want to look for. And that's the box where you want to go and access the resources that are available. And when you click on it, you're going to actually go to another page that shows you a box that says field tests. You'll click on the field tests, and this is what's going to open up when you do that. And again, things have changed, because as of today, since the testing window just opened, the test administrator 
the interface, um, test administrator interface, which is the middle box, is actually already available too. Just in case, if you're not a Tide, if you do not have access to Tide, when you go back, Tide is the student information uh, system where all the student data is maintained for Smarter Balance. Every district test coordinator was given access to Tide several weeks ago. And it was their responsibility to give access to their site test coordinators and their test administrators. That access that they have to the Tide portal is the same access that's going to give you to the other two portals that are up here. You use the same name, the same login, and the same password. They're not different ones for different portals, which I think is really nice. When one, only remembering one I can handle at this age, but not three. Um, another key thing about this page is over to the, I'm going to have to step out, I have to step out, over here. Right here. Pay attention to those tabs, because, and I'll repeat that again. Pay attention to the tabs to the far right, to your far right. Um, you will see one that says classroom activities. Teachers can already go on and see the subjects of the classroom activities and the performance tasks. They can't see the performance task yet, but they can see the subject of the performance task. And they can download the 30-minute classroom activity that precedes that performance task. The other really good tab is right beneath that. It's called Resources and Documentation. I love that tab and they're updating it all the time. It has, you can download PDF files from there, you can view tutorials, and you can view a lot of other resources that can help you in communicating with parents. Here are just a few examples. The test administration manual is there. The test administration user guide. Frequently asked questions about the usability, accessibility, and accommodations guidelines. There's a nice two-page fact sheet about the field test. There's training modules and tutorials. Some of those training modules are as short as six minutes. Some are as long as an hour. But there are quite a few of them on there, and they're really nice. They're very well done. And then there's information on the item types that students are going to see. It's a downloadable file. There is also called. Um, uh, there's also one tutorial where you can view all the universal tools that are accessible to all students in the, in the student interface. And you can also see one on, on um, oh shoot, let me write, let me remember the name. Where did I put my notes? I want to remember the name because I thought it was so well done. Oh, I didn't bring my notes. Anyway, you do need to look and check out all the resources that are there and check it periodically. I would say every other day because they're constantly updating those resources. Um, okay. Okay, additional resources. I already pointed you to the, uh, where you can sign up for the updates and listservs by the California Department of Education. And you can always give me an, send me an email. If you have my phone number, you're welcome to call. And if you, you, know, you haven't want to give it out, I don't mind. I only use a cell phone for all purposes, and that hasn't changed in a number of years. Um, and I am more than happy, if you have questions about the field test, I'll follow up. And if I don't have the answer, I'll make sure to get you the answer. Because we want to make sure that, and, and do it promptly. And people, that, and people that know me know I do respond rather quickly and make sure that you get a good, thorough answer to your questions. So we welcome any, any thoughts, any feedback. Um, we are, now that the field test is getting underway, you know that we're very much interested in what the challenges are, what is working, what is not working. We'll be collecting all that information over the next few months because we want to then start to identify what do we need to do to get ready for the operational test. We have a year, but you know how fast time flies, so we want to make sure we'll be ready on time. Okay. Do I have time for questions? Or do you need to move on? Okay. Email me questions if you have any. Fred. <laughs> Thank you. Ready? Thank you. Uh, 
Um, yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fred Uwe, and I breathe and eat Common Core. Okay, <laughs> as you could tell from the title, okay? Uh, Transform Triumphant Triumvirate of True Partnerships. I did read the ELA standards, and there is this called alliteration. So you'll see a lot of this in my presentation. So can everyone hear me back? Okay, all right. Um, this partnership actually originated from a call from CPEC, which was the California Post-Secondary Educational Commission, but that has been moved to another agency now, okay? And it's called, it's still CPEC, but it's housed in CDE. Um, Okay, and part of the uh, requirement was you need to form a partnership with, uh, among three units, County Office of Education, LEA, and IHE. So in the IHE division, I am the lead project, uh, principal investigator, and we need to have two components of that. One is from the College of Education, and the other one is from the content area and Dr. Derek Chang is our partner for that. And in LACO, we have Dottie Saez, Della Larry Moore, who is seated back there. Okay, there she is. Thomas Amia, Diane Kinch. These are all the partners that we have. And from Montebello Unified, we have Teresa Granados, Patricia Alvarez, Arturo Navar, John Myers, and I have to mention the teachers. Without the teachers, this, there wouldn't have been any of this. Okay, it's the hard work of the teachers that I have to keep on mentioning, okay? And of course, we have the ITQ advisor and two other components of that will be the staff people in CPEC, Marsha Trott and Kevin Wolfork. They've been very patient. As you could tell, this is more than a triumvirate, okay? This is a whole village, okay? Now, these are the goals. I won't read them to you, okay? But these are the ones that we have submitted for CPEC. Okay, now just a summary of the project. Again, it was funded by CPEC, we're the 800 cohort, and it was good for two years, right? And basically what we have, we have professional development meetings, we have our institute summer and winter, okay? And we have our follow-ups, and we have meetings, peer observations, peer reviews that we went to visit each other classrooms. Okay. And of course, our focus was on the common core, but apart from that, we also focused on technology, okay, which gave room for our digital citizenship. And we are way ahead in the sense that we have thought of that we need to also focus on the ELs. So we have incorporated the ELD standards, and in fact, when we did the planning matrix wherein they have to format their lesson plans, Initially, when I first constructed, one of the teachers said, you know, we need to put language objectives there, and which we did. So towards the end, as they kept on planning, we had to make sure that they have both the objectives there. And of course, we have to make sure that there's content and pedagogy embedded in those trainings. Uh, as a gift or incentive or bribe, whatever you want to call that, okay? We provided iPads for the teachers. Part of it is because we need to give, get them ready for this SMAC assessment, okay? They need to learn how to use technology. They need to prepare their students for the 21st century skills, okay? And we also gave them Apple TV. We do want teachers to be able to monitor or mirror whatever they're doing on their iPad, and we gave them LCD so that they don't have to be limited with regard to their mobility, okay? And teacher participant, and of course, we also have to give them TLC. If you don't know what TLC is, it's tender loving care, okay? We really do need to make sure that they know and they understand that how valued they are, okay? Because they are the ones in the forefront, okay? We need to make, we need to make that message to them that we appreciate their presence. And sometimes, just like in any other family, okay, you have a little bit more, some deserving more than the other, but we give in, okay? <laughs> All right? I'm going to be very honest with that, okay? But we do, okay? TLC is important, okay? 
All right? Now, we're fortunate that Montebello already have formed their PLCs, the professional learning communities. So what we did is that we capitalized on that structure and made sure that we have this put into the system. So they do talk about Common Core, they do talk about mathematics, they do talk about our sessions. Okay? And we afforded them the opportunities to observe each other. We factored it in, in our budget to make sure that they get to see practices. Okay? More type of a lesson study, be it good or bad, we never judged. Okay? All we did is for them to observe and discuss. I was one of those that observed classes. I really did. And you will see all these teachers who, got, uh, who would go through the evolution okay, for something that is starting from just paper and pencil to much more of a TPR approach, an inquiry model of teaching. So you get to see that. Okay. And we made sure that we offered time for collaborative planning. Even part of our PD sessions and PD meetings, we have to make sure that there is time for them to collaborate. Okay? And one of our, uh, actually it does finale, it is our ending, is that we have a common core community extravaganza. All the sites were featured, okay? We, ha we have one of their high schools and then they get to showcase what they have done for the past two years. Okay, so we opened it up to other teachers, administrators, board members, parents, the community. Okay, so now, top 10 tips taken from the project. Again, the alliteration. Okay, so top 10 tips taken. It's a, a little mouthy, and I'll do it a la David Letterman. Okay, <laughs> 10. Okay, expect the unexpected. Okay, many things that you plan may not happen, okay? But you need to be flexible. We're all teachers here. You've done that, okay? And do expect that changes will happen. In as much as you plan, whether it's the Wi-Fi or whether it's the delivery or whether it's the paperwork, okay? Be flexible. Next, third time is the charm, maybe, okay? <laughs> All right, you have to be resilient. You have to prod. There are many things going on, and sometimes they put your request wayside. You try to do it, okay? Oop, that didn't work. Okay, let's try it again. Oop, that didn't work too. So let's see. So hopefully, like I said, third time is the charm, okay? Hey, hey, ho, ho, okay? Voice out your concerns. If that's not the right Okay, formula for you, change it. Okay, make sure, because your concern may be others' concern too. Okay, we try to limit hallway talk. We want to make sure it's out in the open. Okay. To err is human, to forgive divine. Okay, that could also double as it's easier to, um, how do they say that? It's easier to, Ask for forgiveness than permission, okay? Because sometimes there will be some forms that I did that, oh, that's incorrect, that's not the right protocol. Oh, well, then, fine, lesson learned, okay? Next, okay, slow and steady wins the race, meaning things happen according to their own paces. Don't rush things, okay? Like I said the first time, you need to be flexible. There are so many things that I want to happen immediately, but you know, it has to go through several channels. But you just make sure that, okay? Be patient, it will happen, okay? There's no I in team, very true, okay? Even though I'm the designated project leader, that's just a title. I couldn't have done it without my team, truthfully. Okay. okay, they are very encouraging and they make sure that we blend well together. I cannot take the credit. In fact, I'll be the first one to admit it, okay? I think I'm the one that did the least, okay? But we made sure, of course, that okay, everyone moves accordingly. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, okay? Find out what it means to me. Respect is mutual. 
okay? Just because we are designated IHE, that doesn't mean that we're any better than you saying that you are an LEA or a COE. It doesn't really matter, okay? We are in the same. We're in it together. We work for each other. We, IHE, we are the ones that do the service, okay? We do that. Okay, beam me up, Scotty. Okay, those of you who are Star Trek fans, okay? Technology for 21st century, we made sure that we are ahead in the game with regard to implementing tablets, okay? What are the apps available? How do we do our lessons? We do, many of you did Edmodo, but we also did that. We had Blackboard, okay? We need to make sure that we serve our students. The more the merrier, okay? Depending on how you look at it. Because I envision that the more collaboration we get, the better, okay? I see it, the more the merrier. Others might see it, too many cooks spoil the broth, okay? But in my case, because I do value the input that I gain from hearing from people, okay? Every time I do a professional development training, it doesn't matter where I go, okay? It's always a brand new thing because I get to learn new things. I get to learn different techniques. I get to learn different viewpoints, okay? So I need the collaboration. And the last one, laughter is the best medicine, meaning be positive, be calm, and be happy, okay? This too shall pass, okay? But again, you need to be very, very positive and encouraging, okay? So with that taken, Okay. What are the worthy words of wisdom that I will impart for those of you who would want to form partnerships? Okay. First things first, maintain the relationships that you have forged. Whether the project ended, keep it. Don't burn your bridges. You'll never know when you will be tapping that person or that party or that group again. You'll never know when you're going to meet with them, but you need to keep up with that. It's a good resource for you. It's a good network, okay? And you keep collaboration alive across and within grade levels. That's what we have seen from this project. It's not only that you talk to your teachers in the same grade level, but you need to talk to teachers across grade levels and across schools. And if you need to break boundaries, that's fine, okay? Third. We need to include administrators and pupil support in every decision that we make, okay? Just like what you have discovered in your findings, technology is one, middle school is one, and then you have administrators should be part of that. They need to know also, they need to be informed, okay? And change happen and accept the fact that it will happen, okay? It will continue to happen. Okay, you could fight it till the end, okay? But it will change, and you will change. So just be prepared for that, okay? And again, this is very important because you need to maintain your saneness. So keep a positive attitude, all right? And will I do it again? Absolutely yes, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to switch over. Um, this last uh, few minutes together, we're going to look at very briefly some resources, and I'm going to give you um, an opportunity to uh, look at where uh, you can find all the resources that we've had today. If you would um, take out the guide that we gave you, um, and briefly, I wanted to just look at this with you. You all received this. It's from Sucesa, and it is a, a really a great resource for you. Um, philosophical approach on it is it focuses on equity, all standards for all students. And we talked a little bit about that. Both of our, uh, our um, panels talked about that. Um, and everybody has kind of alluded to it. We want to make sure that we have high expectations for all of our students. And then that highlight on local control. What one district is doing might not be the exact fit for another district. 
I think this next piece is really critical. Um, it's a starting point for collaborative conversations around instruction. Every conversation, every resource today talked about that. It's an opportunity to rethink instructional improvement, and I think this has been said more than once today, probably at least five or six times, teachers are front and center of this initiative. What's happening in the classrooms is extremely important. We need to promote well-rounded civic and liberal arts education. If you look, I believe it's on page five of the guide on the margin on the, I guess it's the left-hand side. You'll see at the top one of the resources that was created by uh, one of our consultants, Michelle Herzog, she's here, and it looks at civic education. And we know that 21st century learners need to be good citizens. So Common Core brings back that civic education piece. Another philosophical approach of this document is bringing back the arts. Key, and our arts consultant is sitting back there and she's got a big smile on her face. As we talk about close reading, we also need to think about close observation. Why not take students through a process of looking at one of the masters with a close observation followed by um, a writing assignment, a close reading. So all of those are the philosoph philosophical underpinnings of this document. I think I am going too fast. Okay, so purpose. Um, we, want, we want to assist school districts and leadership teams. We've talked about all the team approaches today and identifying those areas of common core for full implementation we heard from Michael Kurtz this morning, this is not a short journey, five years, maybe even longer, to get where we want to go. And then to determine what the next steps are for that implementation. So five areas. This serves as a guide for Common Core. It's a uniformity. We're all on this journey together, but certainly um, we're going at different speeds and at different rates. And again, local context plays an important role in that. Fred just talked about that. Our panels talked about this. Um, Brian talked about this, the importance of collaboration with critical partners, whether those are partners um, outside of your um, organization or within your organization. That collaboration is going to need to be um, a high priority. And then this is a dynamic document. As Gina says, that um, assessment web page changes daily. This will also change as we move through this journey. So this guide is meant to be a living, breathing document. And as we learn from the journey, as we learn from best practices, as we learn from our challenges and our successes, the document will again grow and meet the needs of where we are in this journey. And then, of course, what are our next steps for implementation? So. What are the component areas of the document? There's an area that talks about teachers. What about instruction? What about administrators, students, and certainly that community outreach? Renette talked this morning about the data of how we begin to message this piece. Monica talked about you know, the importance of the messaging and getting this out to our communities and our stakeholders, our business partners, so that they know what we're doing and they can join in that collaborative effort with us. Here are the key components. I'm not going to go through all of these because I know that we've been here for about three hours. But there are 10 components, each a unique opportunity for, for professional development and professional learning back at your districts and school sites. It goes everything from um, the capacity building to aligning instructional materials to um, technology support and so on. But there's 10 key areas in this document that you can begin to look at as where are we in this process and have we addressed this and where do we need to go next. So the guide follows, and I'm not going to read those, it follows um, a, a, a common piece for each of the sections, descriptions, and then um, suggested steps in that. So all of those are in each section, and it's very easy to read and very easy to follow. 
About, um, well, at the beginning of the year, there were a lot of surveys coming out, and at the request of our superintendent, Educational Services um, did our own uh, survey here at LACO, and many of you were called upon by us to look at what the priorities are. And lo and behold, the priorities really mirrored the priorities of the CDE report, many of the priorities of the, um, of the other surveys that were done. And we asked districts to rank the top three areas that they needed support in um, from us through educational services. And obviously, number one, two, and three were Common Core Transition and Implementation. 99% of the districts surveyed said, yes, that's what we need. Technology, Instructional and Infrastructure, 40% of the districts said we need that. And then Support with Assessment, Smarter Balance. Um, and that was a 23%. That might change if we did this survey again today. Um, the next three were special needs students in response to intervention, closing the achievement gap and promoting student achievement, and then a science and math focus. The next three were English language learners, materials and textbooks, and leadership development. Certainly all important areas that um, we can begin to look at. So in closing, I'd like to um, tell you how you're going to access all these materials. Before the end of the week, you're going to get an email um, on the same system that you uh, registered for this event, um, our OMS system, and you're going to ask to do a survey if you would please do that and return it. But you're also going to get a link to a live binder. How many of you are familiar with live binder? Okay. We're going to use that to place all the PowerPoints, all the materials referenced today, and you'll have access to that as we um, go through our journey for Common Core. We will add to that, and you'll have access to that. Um, forever <laughs> as we continue to, to build that, uh, that uh, piece. Over on um, the right-hand side, uh, there are tabs, and some of them will be put in cross-reference. But um, again, all of the PowerPoints, all of the resources, the documents that have been um, referenced today will all be there for you, and you'll be able to access that. The link will be on your survey. It'll also be on our Common Core website, laco.edu uh, slash Common Core, and you'll be able to access that, as well as the video production of today. So um, before we close, I would like to close with a very short story, and it is a, um, do I have it? I do have it. Kind of reminds me of our story of our Common Core journey. Some of you may have heard this before, and it's about a ship's captain. And he radios what he foresees as an obstacle in his course, and he says, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. And that obstacle says, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Response, no, I say again. You divert your course. This is an aircraft carrier, USS Abraham Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. Response, this is a lighthouse, your call. So as we venture on this journey of Common Core, we know that there will be lighthouses, and we may have to divert our journey from time to time. But we're going to stay the course because it's the right thing to do for children. Yes, question.
Now, PTA is doing um, a huge outreach to parents and community and um, doing it in several languages. So we'll have that link on there for you to you can access because it's an excellent way to begin to reach your parents in your community. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Is this a debit card for a million dollars? It is. No. <laughs> that is a USB port, okay, that you can um, use to put all kinds of things on it. And if you forget what our um, website is, you can either use your QR, co co uh, QR code or you can have our uh, website on there and you can uh, find out uh, all of these, all this information. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. If you want to send me that, you want to send me a link, we can also put that on our, on our live binder. So thank you very much. Thank you again to our districts and all of our presenters. Thank you, David, for all of this, okay, and bringing all of these resources and uh, have, helping us to host this meeting. Thank you.